Thank you. Not that Christian Christmas levity isn't appreciated. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Wareham School Committee. It is approximately 7 p.m. on December 21st, and we will begin with public participation. Seeing none, we will move on to good news. Dr. Rabinovich. Already, huh? You're asking for good news. <laughs> um, I really don't have any. I mean, everything is going pretty smoothly, and I don't want to jinx it, so. And it's rain and not snow. That is correct. Ken, any good news? Um, well, it's not good news, but I, maybe it is. I just want to, uh, for those who didn't know, on behalf of the school committee, extend our condolences to um, Jeff Sweat and the family for the loss of his uh, mom. I know that feeling. It's a, it's a big hole in your heart, and my thoughts and prayers are with the Sweat family. Uh, so I guess it's good news because she's probably in a better place than, <laughs> than we are right now. That's all I have. Thank you, Ken. I, I just want to say on behalf of my mother and my father, who I lost four years ago, that I think it's a, it's a credit to the whole community that my mother more than once said it was one of the best 10 years of her life, actually in my mother's case, 14 years of her life, that she spent in this community. And uh, I'm grateful for that, grateful for the fact that I had the good luck and to move her from New Jersey to, to Onset, and uh, grateful for the uh, warm wishes and condolences that have been expressed to me. Um, so thank you. Rhonda. I just wanted to uh, wish everyone uh, happy holidays. This is our last school committee, I think, definitely before the holidays, but also the new year, correct? Correct. So we'll all be meeting together again in 2012, but I just wish everyone a, a healthy and happy holiday season, and kids are about to get out, so please, please, please take good care of them. Amen. Um, Anything else? We don't have Jessica for good news, so we'll move on to the minutes of our meeting of December 7th. Any additions, corrections, augmentations? Good evening, Dr. Sylvia. How are you, sir? Happy holidays. Same to you. Um, I, I do want to point out, while... Um, People are considering the minutes of December 7th. Just prior to December 7th, we had a workshop related to um, student growth percentiles uh, within the district. Uh, it was posted as a meeting. Uh, in the end, there was not a quorum. Um, so we, have, we simply have notes to that meeting um, for ourselves, but we will not be voting on the minutes because technically it was not a uh, meeting of the school committee. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, on the minutes, just, I don't know how important it is, just a grammatical uh, correction. Under fall athletic report and request for grade eight, uh, the third says regarding Mr. Font. Um, at least it's electronically. I don't know if it's on the hard copy. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know how relevant Should be that S is. S apostrophe instead of apostrophe. Okay. Yes. Good. Good catch. S with that correction, Mr. Chair, I make a motion to accept the minutes as reported on December seventh. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion on the minutes? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It passes 4-0-0. Zero, zero. I do want to make a note that we have one of the more uh, positively aggressive athletic directors I think we've, we've ever had. Um, and thanks to his persistence, the girls' tennis team, I don't want to admit that there might be a slight bias here, but the girls' tennis team has been added to the group of um, three other areas, meaning boys tennis, boys and girls track, so that they will be eligible for eighth grade participation. And I greatly appreciate Mr. Larranger's uh, efforts on behalf of uh, the athletic 
tennis of Wareham and especially girls tennis. Okay, Dr. Rabinovich. Okay, um, I'd like to report on yesterday's um, full day uh, budget meeting with the FinCom. Um, we had four members of the finance committee, including the chairman of the finance committee there. Um, we held it in the middle school library. It was started at approximately 8.30 in the morning and went until approximately 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, and in your, um, I've given you electronically, but also today, because I had extra ones, hot copy Thank of you. the uh, two PowerPoints that were given. The shorter of the two um, with the 22 slides was my presentation and the 72 slides has the presentation by all of the uh, principals and directors and so forth in it. Um, so I've given it to you because I'm hoping that if you look through it and if you had some questions or concerns if you either drop by and talk to me or email me or call me um, before the January 11th meeting when I do the presentation to the school board, I might be able to add some things and add clarifications. So um, the bottom line, so to speak, and in your package there is a letter that I sent to Mr. Andrews um, by December 15th, which is by charter, that um, the net school spending number that we are looking for is $27,195,370 and we are looking for $1,585,277 for non-net school spending uh, for a total of $28,780,647. Um, and that is approximately 7.6 percent above what we had last year. Um, at the end of the uh, budget presentation, I made a few comments. One of them was that, that this is the budget that was given to me by all of the directors and principals that the school board has not had an opportunity to view it uh, and approve it. Um, I also showed the charts that we showed last year comparing the achievement gap with the spending gap and um, it is my feeling that unless we close the spending gap we're not going to be able to close the achievement gap and between the fiscal 11 and fiscal 12 school year um, there were 7.5 teaching positions that were lost in our budget um, there were a total of eight people who were unemployed um, at the end of the budget cycle that were employed the year before, um, contrary to what some comments were that the budget had everybody taken care of and that nobody would be laid off. Eight school department employees were laid off. Um, so that is my report at this time and I'd be happy to anybody that wants to give me a call or email me with some of the specifics. Uh, I just want to add a couple of things. One is that I think it's critically important that the public have as much information as possible. Uh, certainly prior to the uh, January uh, 18th, thank you, public hearing, uh, but there will also be a school committee meeting for a full presentation by the superintendent the week before on the 11th and then the final vote um, on the 25th by the, by the school committee. So I am asking the superintendent to post all of the information that was made available uh, to the finance committee and that will be televised um, to make it available on the website so that people can thoroughly understand the, uh, the request and the dollars associated with those requests. Uh, I also want to publicly thank uh, the school, uh, excuse me, the FinCom and the chairman of the Capital Planning Committee uh, for being represented at uh, last week's, uh, yesterday's meeting rather, and uh, to express the fact that I'm feeling a little lonely at these budget meetings and if anybody on the school committee can be present uh, in addition to myself, I would be most appreciative, although I understand 
um, how busy our schedules can, can get. Um, and I have been informed that the, uh, by my able vice chair, Rhonda, that the, uh, the television, um, now I'm, this is, you wrote down education channel. It's not, it's not channel nine and the, and the files channel, whatever that is. Right. So there's the, the Comcast channels. The educational channel is on 97 and the, um, government channel is on 95. I'm okay. not sure about the other ones. Okay, so on December 27th, from 1 to 7, uh, which I realize is an extraordinary amount of time to devote to this, uh, to our viewing audience, um, the educational channel will, as well as the December 30th, will have the, the complete package, and then the government channel on, ge on January 1st. There's got to be a better football game to watch on <laughs> January 1st than, than the uh, budget presentation. So I strongly suggest you, you work on the 27th and 30th for, your, for scheduling your viewing. Mr. Chair? Yes. It is also an opportunity for folks to tape them while watching something else. They have three chances to tape the meeting where they are able to fast forward. I'm not going to name any names here, but through parts that they might not care to listen to, to, uh, to hear some of the pieces that they are very, very interested in. It is a way that you can break it up, and I encourage everyone. It's, I apologize, Mr. Chair, that I wasn't there yesterday because I feel that that meeting and hearing the presentations from each one of the principals, each one of the buildings, and each one of the administrators um, or executive staff is just gave me so much information um, last year. Um, it's an important uh, meeting to view to really understand the needs of our um, of our district, um, the needs of our teachers, and also the needs of our our kids. And um, it just it gives you. I know that I hear a lot that um, I hear many times that uh, I don't have enough information about the budget. This is available to you, and you have an opportunity to tape it or to see it on one of the televised nights um, or get it from a friend. I I hope one day that we could actually upload these to the website so people can download them at any time. Um, but since we don't have that option now, um, again, I just encourage everyone to please um, do your best to really um, take a look at this information so you are able to make informed decisions once we get to town meeting. Thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, I also want to say that um, notwithstanding the length of yesterday's meeting, there, were, uh, there was some excellent um, discussion with members of the Finance Committee, Capital Planning Committee, and uh, School Management and myself. So I think it was actually a, a very productive, productive day. I, I do want to say that one of the questions that was asked of us was why we didn't react um, to the town administrator's draft preliminary budget and the number he used for the school district. Um, I want to say that um, I share our superintendent's feelings on that, and that is that it is, by definition, a preliminary draft budget. There is n essentially no information on revenue, um, and I am sympathetic to the fact that the town administrator had to prepare a budget by December 15th by charter with so little information. So I am certainly hopeful that the numbers reflected in the draft budget will significantly change. And, and I will certainly reserve my, my thoughts and comments and, until such time. Um, with that, I will move back because I neglected to go to the school committee reports um, and ask if any of the members of the school committee have any, uh, any reports on their subcommittees or, excuse me, their advisory committees. Rhonda? Uh, so the committee, uh, one of the... Uh, groups that I had is the Community Relations Subcommittee, and you'll be hearing a presentation shortly um, from our guests um, that are here tonight around one idea um, of how to gain uh, more, more um, input from or volunteerism from parents, getting the name of the school out there and everything that we're doing, so you're going to hear one way um, that we go about that. So that's kind of the update from the Community Relations. The, the policy review committee, subcommittee, uh, met, but unfortunately we didn't have a quorum, and so we, um, you're, we are going to have, we didn't have a chance to talk about 
the concussion policy, but it is on the school committee's discussion tonight because it is something that we need before the first of the year. I do have some comments um, from the committee members that maybe we can talk about during that discussion, but Mr. Chair, um, we're set to meet again second week, Tuesday, second week um, in January, where we'll be a little bit backed up, but we're going to do our best to try to get through as many of the policies as possible. Okay. Thank you. Cliff? Thank you. Ken? Well, unfortunately, my budget review committee met yesterday at the all-day budget, um, and as I discussed before, Mr. Chair, with my schedule of work, it was impossible to get out um, because at NSTAR, we got to try to keep the lights on so you can have those budget meetings. <laughs> keep the <laughs> lights on. That's, a, that's the, one of the better excuses I've ever heard. <laughs> Tell that to the San Francisco well, people. I, Anna keeps showing me the bill, so... <laughs> Uh, I apologize for not being able to attend the meeting with you. Thank you, Ken. Um, uh, two things. One is I have been reminded by our um, chief reminder, that is Michelle, that uh, the National School Board Association, for the first time, is for the first time in at least a long time, is having their meeting in uh, Boston, and we get a break on any registrations. Um, that occurred before December 29th, I believe. Is that correct, Michelle? Um, Massachusetts is before <coughs> January 31st. Oh, we get a break until... Because we're Massachusetts. Otherwise, ah, okay. otherwise, it would be December 29th. Thank, okay, thank you. So we've got a month to think about it, but it uh, for those of us who have never been to these <coughs> one of these national presentations. I think it might be very interesting. So if you can arrange your schedule, um, the meeting itself, I believe, is like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's, it's it tries to be as convenient as possible. Um, so if you could get to Michelle uh, to indicate your ability to attend before the end of January, that would be very helpful in terms of reducing the registration costs uh, by about $100 per person. Um, and lastly, I wanted to uh, let you know that we have been um, invited to uh, a joint meeting uh, with the school, with excuse me, with the Board of Selectmen regarding transportation. Um, I have discussed this with the chairman of the Board of Selectmen and, uh, a few days ago, and we came to an agreement that it would actually be a more productive meeting if um, four boards were represented in this meeting. And by that I mean the school committee, the Board of Selectmen, Finance Committee and the Capital Planning. I have unofficially spoken to FinCom and Capital Planning, and they have indicated a willingness, a desire to participate. Um, and as I said, that the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen also agreed. Um, we have been in, nevertheless invited to a joint meeting rather than this group of four. My own feelings, as I said, for productivity-related reasons, is we should we should go to two members of each of these four committees plus the town administrator and the superintendent. I have proposed to the chairman of the, of the Board of Selectmen that it take place on January 7th or January 14th. Um, I have subsequently learned that the 7th would present a problem for the chairman of the Capital Planning Committee. So I'm asking for a motion um, that we invite those three other committees to a Saturday morning um, meeting to discuss transportation, uh, school bus transportation in Wareham to be hosted by the school committee at uh, a place to be determined. Uh, I am hopeful that out of this meeting will come a consensus as to how to proceed. I just want to note, however, that the more we talk about this issue, the older our fleet gets. And we have had two engine failures just in the last week, Dr. Oh. Winovich? A couple of weeks, couple yes. In the last couple of weeks. Um, the replacement of those engines would be approximately $8,000 a piece. Uh, that would be putting uh, good money after bad, I think, as the expression goes. So I am, I am hopeful that we can move this process along as expeditiously as possible. So with that, I will, I will ask for a consideration of a motion. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. And, and we can certainly discuss. Thank you. Any discussion on this? Yes, sir. Well, what would be the f what would be the focus of this meeting? I, I, I mean, 
we, with all due respect, if, if the board wants to have a meeting on this issue, we should have a meeting on this issue. But I, I'm for the, for, for the death of me, I don't understand what relevant information has been could be presented that hasn't that hasn't already been presented a hundred times in a hundred different ways. Um, I, I, it's, it just baffles me that this continues to be an issue. It just it just absolutely baffles me because everybody agrees we need buses. People people on other boards ran on children's safety platform and we still don't have buses and we're going to have another meeting. Well, you know, it's nice to play kumbaya and play nice with all the kids, but you know what? I, if, if I don't have a clear purpose as to why we're having this meeting, what is the purpose of it, other than rehash the same old rehash, I just don't see the point with all due respect. I, I actually share some of your thoughts. Um, nevertheless, there does seem to be a lot of misinformation and mixed messages on this subject. Um, and I think, especially since I want this meeting to be public, I would like the press to be present. Um, and I would actually ask Dr. Ravinovich that the meeting open with a presentation by our manager of all the relevant information so that once and for all, perhaps, we can get the specifics associated with transportation, both dollars as well as other aspects of the transportation department out on the table for everybody to hear and for everybody t to question. So I understand your thoughts and feelings, Cliff, and as I said, I share them. But the fact is the Board of Selectmen have uh, invited us to, to a meeting. I appreciate the initiative that they've taken in doing so. I am altering the invitation to, to be more inclusive, meaning to include the Finance Committee and the Capital Planning Committee, and I am hopeful that with this invitation from us and the inclusion of the two other committees that um, we can proceed. Will it be constructive? Will it prove to develop a consensus on this issue? I just remain hopeful. We have a motion. We have a second. We have some discussion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? 4-0-0. Thank you. With that said, I am very appreciative of our guests, and I welcome the members of the Falmouth uh, VIPs to, to join uh, my colleague at, at the table, and we look forward, forward to your presentation.
As you might have known, over the last several years, there has been a decline in volunteerism. People are busy, um, jobs, um, snowbirds are you know, traveling, who knows? But um, there is a decline in volunteerism. And so this group is really concentrated on going throughout the South Coast and encouraging volunteerism. They basically said, you're on the school committee, have you heard of Falmouth VITs? They're doing exactly this, but even a model that we want to follow in Falmouth, and they've been doing it for over 30 years. Um, I'm going to have Tracy talk more about this, but the reason why I wanted to bring them here is uh, who you're going to hear from a little bit later, our parent, um, Rebecca Jade. We both went and, and spoke to them, and what we heard loud and clear that this was more just about getting a volunteer coordinator and you know having them go and, and recruit volunteers for the school. It was a way to supplement or to um, add on resources to an existing budget. It's not about um, replacing, it is about encouraging volunteers to help with enrichment programs, to help with public relations, take some of the burden off of our teachers um, that around copy, you, you name it. Um, but more importantly, it was a way to uh, look at programs for our kids to not only help them um, engage in their community, but also to have mentors come in and help some of our most at-risk kids go all the way through graduation. Tracy's going to talk more about that. So, especially now that we just heard the budget gap that we have between the town and us, and I know that we still have a little bit of time, but I encourage you to have an open mind about this program. What you're going to see is probably um, not exactly um, the resources that we would need to do something here, but just the concept of what this program is about, and really have an open mind about um, seeing if this is something that we might want to tackle going into this year. Again, as a way to help with some of the, you know, things that we talk about here and present get presented here about some amazing things that we want to bring into our schools, but we just don't have the resources. This is one way to do that. So with that, I want to turn this over to Tracy Crago, who's the director of Falmouth VIPs, and she's brought with her two board members. Um, we have Heidi Murata. 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 Yeah. Great. <laughs> Um, who is a board member of Family VIPs, but she's also a former school committee member, and also Rebecca Moffat, who is also a board member of Family VIPs and a current member of the school committee. Um, they're here to present, and then I encourage everyone to ask questions too. Thank you. Thank you. Is this is this good or yeah? Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, Ron <coughs> did a great job summarizing, and she was definitely listening when she came to talk to us in Falmouth. That was very good. Um, we're almost to 30 years. We <coughs> celebrate our, our 30th anniversary in Falmouth next year, so we're really excited about that. Um, but we've been at it for 29, so I guess that gives us enough experience to, to come and share our, our story with you folks. Um, I'll start with our mission statement, um, which is, you know, you can read it yourself, but basically, it's really to support, not just encourage and support our volunteers, but to provide them with the tools by training them, um, to support not only the students, but really the faculty and the administration in the public school system. And also, the other big piece of what we do in Falmouth is to facilitate partnerships, and we do that with um, you know, relationships between the community, the schools, the businesses, and individuals who can help, um, help the program out. So a little bit of background, I'll be, I'll be as brief as we can because I know you probably will have questions at the end, but um, VIPS was initiated in 1982. A few folks from Falmouth went up to a Department of Education conference um, where the goal was to really um, get the communities more involved in public education. And they came back very excited um, and those eight folks really got things going at Falmouth High School. Today. Um, each, each school year, um, our volunteers log an average of 40,000 hours a year. Um, I say log because that's what they say they've volunteered, but we know we probably miss a lot of hours, uh, especially from sports parents and, and uh, band, band folks and things like that. And there's also a lot of people who just don't think they need to write down their hours for whatever reason. Um, that number also includes hours logged by students, and we start counting um, volunteer hours by students in seventh grade. Um, we know that they really start counting at the high school level um, when it comes time for colleges and um, job and internship applications, but we'll, we'll start counting them in seventh. And the hours we count for students are pretty much anything they don't get paid to do, as opposed to our adult volunteers who have to be contributing to the, to the public schools. Uh, last year, student volunteer hours accounted for about 23% of our total, 
Um, that's a number that's on the rise, and that's something we're really excited about in Falmouth. We don't yet have uh, a community service requirement for graduation, but we're working on that. Um, so I think that number will continue to grow. All right, how is VIPS, and that's what we call ourselves, how is VIPS organized? Um, we have two staff members. I'm the director, and I have a secretary. We are both full-time employees of Falmouth Public Schools. I also have a board of advisors. So we are a 501c3 organization that happened about t eight, eight years into the formation of VIPS. Um, so my board members, two of whom are sitting with me today, are responsible for raising about 60% of our budget, and then Falmouth Public Schools covers 40%. Um, we also have a very sort of key um, group of folks in VIPS called, we call them building coordinators for lack of a better term. Those are folks that are um, doing most of their volunteering in our schools. So we have seven public schools in Falmouth, so four elementary schools, a grade five, six school, a seven, eight school, and then the high school. So we have building coordinators in each school, and they really serve as our liaisons between, you know, staff members and parents and, and kids in each school and our office, which is located physically at the high school. Um, they really sort of, s because they're so much a part of that particular school community, they're like on the ground. They, they can really help us quickly uh, determine a need for volunteers, even if it's very last minute, um, and, and sort of be that friendly face um, to remind people to log their hours. They help us count hours. Um, and they make sure people um, have paperwork, get introduced to the school, that kind of thing. So those are key people. Uh, and then we also have for some of our larger programs um, what we call program leaders. So for example, we have a school-based mentoring program for at-risk youth. That started in 1994. It's uh, really taken off. It's a big program. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But we have a dedicated program leader that I actually pay an hourly um, salary. Um, for, for overseeing that program. And that's just because that program's gotten so big, it's almost its own thing. Um, so I would obviously oversee that, but then um, we have point people for our bigger programs. And that's just been great because, you know, volunteers can come and they go, um, but these folks are, you know, someone we can really rely on and, and they're responsible for that program. A little bit of structure for how our board is set up. We're a pretty low-key board in terms of um, our bylaws are very, very, very basic. Uh, if you Googled bylaws for nonprofit boards, you'd probably find ours, um, and that's it. Uh, they're really just focusing on memberships, terms, um, and some of the responsibilities of the board members. Our bylaws state that we can have as few as 15 um, board members minimum and a maximum of 21. Um, and within that uh, number, we have two um, members that are representing the school district. So, for example, Rebecca is our school committee representative. Um, we also have Nancy Durfee, who is an assistant principal at one of our elementary schools. So two sort of higher level, I guess you'd call them, um, folks from the district. And we also have two Falmouth High School students on our board. And we're actually thinking about, um, I didn't even tell you about this yet, mm -hmm. we're, we, uh, the executive committee is talking about adding some um, junior high mm -hmm. kids as well, just because we can, they can stay with us for longer and, and help with that continuity. So what do we ask of our board members? Um, fundraising obviously is huge, um, but really helping us sort of plan strategically for the future. Um, we have three fundraisers um, that we do each year, sort of event-based fundraisers. So we have subcommittees that revolve around those. Those aren't just board members, but we have um, community members on those as well. And then we have sort of those specialty subcommittees like you have, um, policy and nominating, public relations and outreach, that's what these guys help me with. Mm -hmm. And then um, fundraising, fundraising and strategic planning. So just quickly about the volunteers, just because in any school district there's going to be the same kinds of responsibilities. I'll talk in a little bit about some of the special programs we have. Uh, some of our volunteers we literally see once a year. They do one thing a year, whether it's judge the high school English cl class debates. They sign up for that every year. They come in, in the, the spring and do that. Um, sometimes chaperoning with a field trip, especially with working parents. Um, they kind of pick and choose what they can contribute to, so that, that would be something that um, working families can do. Um, science fair projects are a big thing, especially with um, access to Woods Hole and all the scientific labs. We have a lot of volunteers that help us with that. And then we have people who, you know, maybe their interest is music, so they help out with the music programs at some level. Then we have volunteers who do something, um, are involved with weekly programs. So that might be helping in one particular classroom on a weekly basis. It could be 
the projects that are listed up on the screen here. Um, these are sort of more formal projects that we have that we would provide training for, and we ask for pretty much a weekly commitment. Um, so I, I can answer questions about those if you'd like. And then we have sort of the one-time thing, um, and these are also where we can get into working with business folks. Um, we do at the high school, we do an annual career day. We just had it right before Thanksgiving. That's for every Falmouth High School junior, and we actually send them out into the community. Um, and that's just been a really great thing. This year we had 97% of the junior class participated in that event, and they went out to, oh, I think 40 three businesses and talked to people in about 88 different career fields. Um, we sent one bus to Woods Hole, we sent one bus out to the base, and then they were all over town. Um, so that was really neat. Um, that's a good one. And a lot of what happens from career day is um, employers will, we fill out an evaluation form and they'll agree to take um, students for internships, job shadow days, actually job jobs. Um, and that's also spun off into a career fair that we now do for the junior high. So those sam same people come in and instead of doing a more advanced presentation, they basically have a table and they talk about that career field as a, just a first introduction. Um, we have a lot of folks that like to share their expertise, whether it's you know math, engineering, um, cosmetology. Uh, once in a while when there's a, a school play or, or the band uh, uniforms need some repairs, we have a little uh, mailing list that we do for people who sew, believe it or not, that's still a big thing, and uh, you know we get that done very quickly. Um, even filing in the health office, things like that. Whatever the request is, pretty much we filled it. In fact, the stranger they are, we usually fill it fastest. All right, how do we place our volunteers? So we have a few steps that we run through. Um, the first thing we ask is that um, volunteers fill out our registration form. We have a couple of versions of this. This is the old-fashioned two-part form. We keep one, school keeps the other. Um, these happen to go home in every single packet that gets sent home with the kids on the very first day of school. You know, that forms packet for parents that your hand is about to fall off or fill in. <laughs> so we have those. Um, there's also the Cori form, obviously, for for checking volunteers. And then we also have what we call a driver liability form, which is for any time um, someone is going to be driving students around. Um, and we have a special policy for, you know, how far people can go in private cars versus buses, just like you probably do. So anyway, the, the big thing is those forms go home in the packets. People are used to them. They fill them out. It's kind of like a routine thing. They're also available on our website. People can print them out. And of course, they're always available in the schools. The step, the second step is that our building coordinators, those folks that I mentioned are, that are kind of school-based, they will help um, quickly sort of identify needs, and teachers do this too, back to school night, meet the teacher night. Um, the teachers are great at having sign-up sheets for different programs. Um, but pretty much all the information that is in here, we can load into our database. So we ask questions like, you know, do you have an area of interest you're interested in? And we plug those into our database that helps us search it later if we need a specific request. Um, and then we'll work with volunteers to sort of place them according to, you know, day of the week they might be available or frequency or just something that they might be interested in bringing into a school. And then the big thing, step four, is kind of that, I think, what makes us, um, well, what's gotten us to be 29 years old, which is the whole, the follow-up, the um, supporting volunteers, the training, if, if an issue comes up, they know that they can call us or talk to their building coordinator and we'll be there to actually work with them to resolve that issue. Sometimes it's just miscommunication, people are busy, and um, so we'll work with them to, you know, to resolve any issues, good or bad, actually. And then the big thing is, um, you know, thanking people. It doesn't seem that <laughs> that difficult of a concept to grasp, but we do a lot of that. We are constantly thanking people in different ways, whether it's an email or a, or a phone call, or we'll have an annual recognition dinner that we do in May. We pretty much fill up the Kuna Messed in, and, um, you know, just it's a great night. It's a really nice night where people can share different stories, and we give out awards and this and that. Um, we also do a similar um, student recognition event as well. Um, but the other, I guess, big piece of that is this whole collaboration coordination piece. Um, there's no gray area about who a principal would call if there's an issue or a request or they want to just try something new. We have some really fun principals that are, are young and, and fun and they'll call and say, what do you think if we, 
and we'll call it a pilot. That's our big thing. Well, we call everything a pilot. Let's just try it. It's a pilot. And a lot of times those things either, you know, they work or they don't or you tweak them. Um, and that's how a lot of our really neat um, programs have actually gotten started, kind of just a brainstorm. School and community connections is another big piece of um, VIPs and a big part of my job, which is great. And um, so the logical step is to work um, through, say, a chamber of commerce, which we're, we're a member of. There's a special rate for nonprofits. Um, that really gets us in the publications, in, in different events, and it also is a great way to sort of leverage out through the chamber working with different local businesses. Um, the chamber is very involved with us for planning career day, for example. Um, we've met a lot of great folks who are also just trying to start up in the community and networking, networking, networking. It's huge. We were talking about that on the way here. People have gotten jobs by volunteering. They've hired people to do work for them through volunteering. Um, so lots of partnering with different groups and not just businesses. We work a lot with um, civic organizations in town. Rotary Club is a big partner of VIPS, but also like the Falmouth Human Services Agency for our uh, mentoring program. They will come in and give presentations for our mentors on different issues, teen suicide, depression, um, substance abuse, and they'll help work with our mentors to give them tools and, and um, a little bit of education about things to look for, th how to talk to, to a teen or a young person about those kinds of issues. Yeah, it is great. And, and they do the in Coast Guard. Yeah, Coast Guard is a big one. I have a picture of them in here coming up. And the other way we like to work with businesses and or, uh, local groups is to say, you know, if you would like to sponsor a vet, great. But if you can send, you know, if you can allow your employees and encourage your employees to come and volunteer during the day when schools are open, um, you know, that would be great. So building relationships with large employers is another big one. And of course, since we're a 501c3, we um, there any donations they make are tax deductible. Another way we celebrate contributions, um, we have an, a program that we call the Business Partners in Education Program. And that's sort of a formal relationship we work out. There's actually a little contract that we write up that, um, for example, I'll, I'll show you the Coast Guard because their picture is there. They really wanted to, they actually have a um, partners in education program of their own in the Coast Guard. So it just so happened they were the same name. And we sat down with the Coast Guard uh, folks in Woods Hole and identified, um, you know, they have a lot of folks available to come in and work in the schools. Education is a big priority for them. And they decided they wanted to pick one school. So they picked the fifth and sixth grade school. And they're there all the time. Um, they do things like cleanup days, field days. Um, we have an anti-bullying program in Falmouth called No Guff. They're going to be playing a big part of that program in January. They come in and talk to the kids about um, you know, name calling and things like that. But they're just a great presence. They always come in these uniforms, and they're just the kids are getting really comfortable having them around and, and it's just been a really neat partnership. So that's one example of a business partners in education program. Um, we have lots of them. I can talk about that more if you'd like. How do we celebrate individual contributions? We again have the annual recognition dinner. Um, that photo is as um, those are our volunteers of the year a couple of years ago for each school. They get nominated by the school community, um, other volunteers and um, folks nominate them. It's just not it's not just about number of hours, it's really about quality of contribution and just the way they are in a school. And we have these special plates made by a Woods Hole Potter um, just, just for us. Those are just for our um, awards and they get those with their name on them and the school that they work in. Um, so that's just one way we like to celebrate our volunteers. Um, getting the word out, like, like here, um, is another part of what we do. Um, it's funny, we'll meet people and say, oh, God, you guys are in the paper all the time. I don't think we are. I don't think we're in nearly enough. But getting, spreading the word about different programs, different um, little success stories. Um, it could be one volunteer working with one student. If you've got a story to tell, it's really important to tell it because people read the local papers. Clearly, they do. And it's, great. it's a great way to um, you know, make connections with folks. We have a newsletter. We used to print it three times a year. We've switched over to having an e-newsletter, finally. Um, so that's another way we get um, our word out to volunteers and our funders. Um, we also, now that we are stepping into this e-world, e we do um, updates, too, which has been great for us because um, 
you know, requests for volunteers are very time sensitive for the most part, so it's been great, <coughs> a great addition to email, um, a way to get, to get the word out. We have a website, um, always writing news releases and putting articles in the paper, speaking engagements, going out to different civic groups, et cetera. And then we do recruiting events as well. We'll have, say, a coffee hour and we'll, you know, talk about our different programs and try to get folks interested that way. All right, probably the most pr interesting part of the presentation for you guys, I guess, would be, um, so how do we fund this thing we call Falmouth VIPs? Um, I mentioned earlier we share our budget <coughs> between the Falmouth Public Schools at about 40% and then the VIPs Board of Advisors. So we do that a couple different ways. We do it through events and fundraising, which I will be completely frank and say they are a tough way to make a living because everyone is doing fundraisers from your PTOs to your local food pantries to your everybody is doing fundraisers. We used we are <coughs> going to be celebrating our 27th golf tournament this spring. Back in the day, 27 years ago, we were probably one of the only ones. Now, there are six between May and the end of June in Falmouth. So we're all hitting the same people up for raffle items. We're trying to get the same people to golf. Everybody wants to donate and contribute, but they're just a really tough way to make a living. Two of our fundraisers happen to be outdoor events, so that's another thing that um, can be really stressful. But anyway, we do them, and um, I don't. I won't go into any detail unless you want to talk specifically about those fundraisers. That's the um, amount of money we target to net from those fundraisers, and then. Um, I actually really enjoy writing grants, so that's sort of been my thing when I came on. I, I, I started this job in um, December of '06, so right away we started writing some grants. And um, you know that FY11 number is pretty. M I mean, we'd like to be at thirty thousand dollars a year in grants. And the, when I say grants, I'm not talking about NSF grants or Department of Ed grants. I'm talking about local grants. And I'll tell you why that's a, an important distinction. If I were to write a federal grant, and I used to do that in my old job, I would need three more people to keep up with the reporting requirements of those grants. I would not be able to spend the money wisely because I would be writing reports about what I was going to do with their money. So we stick with the local grants, United Way, banks, private donations, charitable foundations. Those are the grants that I, I write. Um, you know, I mean, I guess they're a little easier to get. The amounts are small. I mean, we're talking... 1,500 to 15,000 is the typical size. So you're doing a lot of work for it. But it's, um, it, it's just paperwork-wise, it's a lot easier to keep up with those. Um, so far this year, it says 5,000. We're actually at uh, just over 10. We, we just found out that we, we got another one. So that, that's always exciting. Um, by category, see how this comes out. Yeah, it didn't come out great in the printouts. I'm sorry about that. We tried to be fun with our budget and it didn't look too pretty but this is pretty much um, our expenditures by category so no surprise people cost money um, so you know under half of it is for salary and benefits um, and that's the breakdown of the rest it's hard to see those colors I'll read them to you um, so let's see 21 percent is the money that we put into um, fundraising and and events um, let's see 16% is our programming, so um, training, um, program support, um, training materials, that kind of thing for the d all the different programs that we do in the schools. Um, recognizing volunteers, we also give out scholarships um, to two Falmouth High School students every year who are sort of exemplary c um, community service contributors. Um, and I see that we'll probably be having to give out more because we're trying to grow that, so that's a good thing. Um, and then, you know, the other typical categories, sort of communication and outreach and, and supplies. So that's, in a nutshell, our cost, the money that we have to raise um, every year. That isn't the Falmouth Public Schools contribution that goes um, to some of our salaries. So I just made a slide. I was talking to Rhonda about this, and I was like, if we could just leave you with a few thoughts and tips, and I, I, I want Rebecca and Heidi to chime in as well. Um, if you took nothing else away, you know, what are some tips that we've sort of learned over the years in Falmouth? And I think the first one is, and I, I'm not, I don't say this to, to be flip about spending money because it does cost money to hire someone, but I think it's absolutely essential that you have a person who's dedicated to overseeing the volunteer program. 
And the reason is because volunteers are just that. They're volunteers. They're awesome. They're wonderful. I love them all. But something comes up. They get a job. They have to take care of a sick parent. Um, they're not there. You really need a dedicated person. And I, my recommendation would be that it be an employee of Wareham Public Schools. I think it works very well in Falmouth. I, ha I actually report to two different entities. <laughs> I report to the superintendent, but I also report to my board of advisors. I like that kind of checks and balances because they have two completely different perspectives. So it, it doesn't make me crazy. It's actually a really good thing. And Mark, our superintendent, is fabulous. So um, The other thing, for the first full year that VIPS was formed, they planned and planned and planned and had meetings and went around and got input. That is key. You have to put together a planning team of people that don't have just fancy titles, people who are actually going to roll up their sleeves and work really hard and be willing to go out and talk to all the different facets of the community, the business leaders, uh, parent teacher organizations, or PTAs, I think they are here, um, staff members. If you don't have the buy-in from the pub public school staff people, you're going nowhere because they won't request volunteers. So you have to have that buy-in. And that was something that actually happened in Falmouth. Um, there was a lot of resistance to it at first. The teachers were uncomfortable. They were like, they didn't want people looking over their shoulder. And, you know, obviously they quickly learned that that wasn't what the volunteers wanted either. Start small. Um, eight volunteers <coughs> in Falmouth High School. That's how the program started. You know, today we're over a thousand active volunteers every year at 40,000 hours, but it was eight people. Um, transparency, share the plan, get feedback, share your successes, tell your story to everybody. And then the other big piece for us is identifying key community partners. Some partners will come and go, you know, businesses or, or health agencies or service agencies, but get a few partners, you probably already have them that you work closely with, whether it's your chamber, your rotary, uh, maybe it's the Elks Club. Just find a couple people who have a share the vision of what volunteers can do in your school system and how they can help. Those are my main points. And that's my contact information. And you know, Rhonda can vouch for this. I am absolutely happy to talk to you on the phone, by email, sit down. Um, happy to do it. I mean, I think we have a really great thing going in Falmouth. I think we've all gotten a little complacent in Falmouth, so I'm so excited to go talk to somebody else about it. Um, you know, I think people, it's just a way of life. Kids go through Falmouth Public Schools and they think nothing of seeing adults in our school system that aren't rela related to them, but maybe they're mentors, or maybe that's the art lady, or maybe it's the computer guy, and they're just always in the school. It's a very, um, it's, it's just a, been a very positive thing. So I hope that wasn't too much, but. No, I'd love to say just a couple of things, because um, I'm a school committee member and why I got involved in VIPS. Um, one of the key things that a school committee member deals with is your budget. I mean, that's like really one of your core things. And when you um, embark on um, having a volunteer and public school program, what you're doing is you're engaging your entire town and your school system. So in other words, when you start talking about having a Feast of Falmouth where we um, are have businesses and restaurants actually participate in a fundraiser with us, they're meeting the kids, they're meeting the parents, and they're understanding more about your school. And those businesses might not necessarily have children in your schools, but they understand what is happening with your school sy system, and they're much more likely to support your budget when you're trying to get your funding. It's a way for you to advertise. Basically, we all have to advertise in the schools. Like, why are we so great? Why do we need money for our kids? Why do we need... What you're doing with the volunteer in public schools is you're telling about how great you are and what kind of quality education that you have. And I think that the... Um, the types of volunteers that you end up having in, that come in. We have a lot of retirees that come in. They don't have kids in the school systems, but they're seeing what's happening in your um, wonderful schools. And they're saying, you know what, I'm going to vote for the budget, or I'm going to try to support them when they go before their town meeting. Um, people that are unemployed, they have the time on their hands, and you need to tap into those resources because, you know, 40,000 hours is a lot of hours. A thousand people is a lot of people that are actually supplementing your education that you're giving to your children. Um, talents. A teacher 
is a wonderful resource, but when you have people that like maybe are in the scientific community and they're coming in and they're talking about their job or they're like volunteering in a classroom and they're explaining some type of science to these kids, you're tapping into a resource that's actually raising the level of your education of your students. So my natural progression to come off of the school committee was to become involved in VIPS because I believed in it so much to um, support um, the program. Part of the other facet is that one of the things that Tracy talked about a little bit was the high school students. When you look at your high school population, we realize that high school students get out of school earlier and they're not necessarily going to their sport activities. The elementary schools are still open. They can transition directly from their high school to the elementary school and spend, in, spend time during their day volunteering with the kids. What a great opportunity for older kids to mentor younger kids. They're coming into the schools and they're meeting the younger kids and they're actually showing them like, hey, you know, you're going to end up in high school and be like me someday. And you're actually creating a really nice partnership between older students and younger students. So there's so many facets to um, the benefits of the program that um, I just think that if you did try to start it, it would be a wonderful addition to your school system. Mm -hmm. I think the, what I would probably say to you is the first time I was introduced to VIPS, I was incredibly impressed with it. Um, I'm a teacher of more than 40 years, and I never worked at a place that had, had the program such as uh, Falmouth had. And I could not believe the amount of people that would come and would volunteer and do the things that we just think in public schools, this is what we do um, as being an employee of a public school. But I think the biggest thing that I noticed this evening as Tracy was speaking to you, this is a very important part of the Falmouth Public Schools. VIPS is very important to us. So as you hear her go through each one of those things that have happened and how that built up, it could be overwhelming. And I think the other part is to think how innocent it, it started with eight people who thought there was something that possibly they could do for the public schools. And I think that is the thing that I would encourage first. Rather than look at a program that has been almost 30 years in the works and is very successful, that it is how it started and to think how everything in Falmouth with their commitment. And I think as Tracy gave you each, each thing to think about in starting it is to really start with small steps and have that solid commitment. And then as you watch that, just like a spider web into your community, it's one of your best things that you have in public schools. And to tell you how impressed, because now you know where I'm going with this, to tell you how impressed I was with VIPS and, and was on the board and whatever, we had our Senator Kerry give us acknowledgement on the floor of the Senate to talk about the, the VIPS in Falmouth because I just could not stop talking about it. And that's as high as I could possibly go until we got to the president. <laughs> so when I, when I talk about it here this evening, it is a very impressive public school activity, and, but it's how you start with it. And you have a great resource right here to ask all of your questions. One last part of the presentation, if the board would allow me, is that I do have uh, parents here today that, and they would just like to say a few words from the parents' perspective of, an important, of the importance of a program like that. So, I'd like to thank the three of you for coming tonight and sharing your story with everybody. It's a very impressive one, and uh, hopefully we can learn a lot from what you've done and accomplished in Falmouth. I just wanted to add from a parent's perspective, I have two children here at Minot in Wareham, and um, I really think that there's a need for a program that's an organized system and that manages the parent volunteers. Uh, we really have a large pool of volunteers already in the school systems, and there's a really big need for them. But I think that a program like the VIPs would really maximize the volunteer base and increase support for the staff and also provide a cost-effective way to bring enrichment opportunities to the schools. Um, there's been a lot of discussions at different meetings and principals' coffees from parents who volunteer or would like to volunteer of sort of having a go-to person within that schools to coordinate the time and the tasks 
and the people themselves. And there's often a last minute sort of push for volunteers for different events, which isn't very efficient in the end. Um, there's a lot of parents and family members out there who really could be utilized in our school system if they were just asked or felt like they could really contribute to some of the schools in, in a variety of different ways. Um, I also think that the VIPs is a program that really encourages community involvement and outreach, and it really has the potential to unify many of our town's assets to help achieve some of our goals as a school district. It just seems like a logical way to work with the resources we already have, but in a more structured manner. And I also love that Tracy and her team have done a lot of the, the legwork already, and they have a model that we can really modify to fit the suited and suit the needs of our school system here. So, thank you. do you want to say anything? Could you, I'm sorry, could you uh, come up to the mic so everybody can hear you? People at home. <laughs> yeah, I, <coughs> it doesn't amplify it, but people at home. Hello. <laughs> um, again, I have could two you children. Could yourself, please? My name's Liz Wiley, Thank and you. I have two children at mine at Forest. And uh, again, I've tried to volunteer in the, in the classroom, and one of their teachers was very, you know, yes, come on in, and another teacher didn't really want us to, um, which is fine, um, but, but my time could be used somewhere else, um, and there's definitely a need, having par participated in a lot of the principal's coffees and seeing that there's a need, but there's, there's no organization around it. There's nobody that's saying, oh, we need parent volunteers in the, in the lunchroom. Um, they talked about hiring, hiring two staff people to be volunteer, you know, to work in the lunchroom, and I thought that that seems like a complete waste of resources when we could hire a part-time or a full-time volunteer coordinator <coughs> to put all of that into action. Um, there's a library that's not being used because there's not the resources to staff it, and again, there's just so many, not only parents, because we, we, we've talked to other people, there's people in this community that want to participate. There's uh, you know, we know somebody that's a grandfather that likes to go in. My, my mom would like to go in. So there's people that would like to help out, but there's nobody to support that. And the resources that you've outlined and how clear this can be implemented, it seems sort of like a no-brainer. Um, we, we need it. Our school needs it. Our teachers need it. The staff needs more support. It's there. We just need to make the connections, and this seems like the perfect opportunity to do it. Very supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. There's, you know, there's so much more that could be said around um, this amazing program, but I think that it's probably the, the right time to kind of open it up to the city members to see if you have any specific questions around the existing program in Falmouth. Um, just any information that maybe wasn't up there on there just for you today. Ken? Yeah, just a question, uh, Tracy. On the... Um, in your budget, that's pretty impressive from 9000 to 23000 Would you say a lot of that success is from extra hard work or the local community buying into, you know, what BIPS has done? And the second part of that, is the school always responsible for 40% or does that change based on grants and donations? Okay. Great questions. Um, I think that that money is, has always been there. It's just, it was kind of untapped. And I think our programs were just waiting to be told and shared. The first time I ever met with um, Rich Brothers at United Way, he said, how could this be? How could this be in Falmouth with 40,000 hours and 1,000 people and I hadn't heard about it? So I think it's just, again, it's like getting out there and telling your story. Um, you know, there are a lot of small banks that we, we have a lot of banks in, on the Cape and they all have charitable foundations. The grant writing process is very basic for them because they want to give the community their money. Um, so they're out there and I can give you the list. That we, I mean it's, you know, it'll be competition but that's <laughs> all right. I'm up for it. Um, the second question with the budget, 40%. Um, that's a very good question. I'm not sure historically. I'm assuming that at one point the school did pay more. Um, but I do you know? Well, no, but um, I think that what happened, like if you look at how we actually budgeted that um, percentage, um, if the budget is going up with Tracy getting more grants, 
we're actually increasing our training. So like we're, we're supplementing the program yeah. even more. So the public schools has maintained a steady amount, but if we're getting more money through the grant writing process, we're training our volunteers. We're actually getting quality um, training and, and bringing that in. So that money is actually supplementing and, and pushing the program further ahead rather than taken away from um, what the, the town has to um, uh, supplement with. So. And one of the things when I was there for the presentation that I thought was important, was an important message from Tracy was that it's important for the Wareham public school system to have skin in the game. You need to be able to have um, the Wareham public schools see this as a, um, as a benefit, as a program within the school, make a commitment to it, um, just because it gives it yep. uh, more credibility and also it doesn't run the risk of all of a sudden becoming an outside program, mm -hmm. you know, because it is, it, it yeah. is seen as part of the, the, um, the Falmouth Public Schools and something that, um, again, is elevated. Sure. Well, I was just wondering on the, like the 40%, mm -hmm. um, the 2011 budget, rounded off to ninety thousand dollars so the school is responsible for about thirty six thousand dollars would that be part of the coordinator whatever that position was salary or yeah. is that in addition yeah that would be part of that so in other words my, the my budget the ninety thousand dollars includes the portion of my salary and my secretary salary that we are responsible for does not include the part that the School district is responsible for. The coordinators are actually volunteers. Are you mean the coordinators? Each one no, the, I think he means the, full, secretary the full time yeah. Um, yeah. person that oversees the entire yeah. comes from the school. One more question, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you tell me a little about your, the involvement with the anti bullying program? Yeah. Because yeah. That's, that's a hot topic. It's in, a hot in topic. School. I heard you. No we call it no guff, and it's so funny. We just went to this big thing up at Northeastern last week. There were 4,000 students. It was a statewide anti-bullying rally. It was so great, and we took our program up there, and we had a table. And the kids would come up, and they scratch their head, and I was like, are you stumbling on the word guff? And they're like, yeah, what does it stand for? I said, well, it's kind of an old-fashioned word. I said, my grandfather used to say, don't give me any guff. And it just really means, you know, don't talk back, don't talk badly, don't say things that are negative. So that's kind of the history. It came up, um, it's 11 years old now. We've been doing this in Falmouth. It started with one day at the high school. It's now a whole town-wide, week-long at all the schools. Um, the kids get t-shirts. We do, there's programs going on, um, the planning for them already. And it's, it's kind of like a multifaceted thing. I mean, the anti-bullying piece, we moved our week to January to coincide with the governor's no-name calling day that last Wednesday of the month, so that actually falls on the 25th of January. So we moved No Guff Week in Falmouth to be that whole week, just to have a nice sort of tie-in. But I would love to share some of the things that we're doing over there. It's really great. We do different things at different schools because the kids are different ages, and they some things that work with the fifth and sixth graders wouldn't at the high school, but at the high school on Friday afternoon there's a big rally the kids vote for um, students in their class that they feel sort of exemplify no guff behavior all the time and that's um, those kids you know get that award the no guff award and uh, it's fun I mean one of the local businesses pays for t-shirts so all the kids wear the exact mm -hmm. same t-shirts and the staff um, that week so it's pretty fun. I just want you to know I was racking my brains trying to figure out what the G-U-F-F yeah, stood for. I, <laughs> I must have repeated that up like you're, you're 500 times. You're not old times. enough, Ken. I know what, knew what Guff was. Did you? Yeah, it's funny. The kids today do not know, yeah. except in Falmouth, but it was funny. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that's Cliff? Yeah. Oh, kudos. Um, I, I think that <clears throat> one of the advantages um, that you have in Falmouth that we may not have here um, is the fact that uh, I have a summer house in Falmouth also. Uh, the resources there. I mean, you've got the Woods Hole, and you, you've, you've got a lot of resources that you can tap into. Uh, we're getting there, mm -hmm. especially our industrial base. But uh, what I like about the program is that it provides, you provide a hub uh, yeah. for the volunteers to feel comfortable going into schools. Yeah. Right now, I think that um, the administrators are overworked, the yeah. teachers are overworked, and, and, and almost uh, people that we talk to 
that want to volunteer really don't feel real comfortable with the fact that you know they they've got to sort of take the initiative and then they're not really sure what's going on and we really don't have the time internally yeah. to provide the kind of support that they really need what this does is it provides a nucleus yeah. uh, or or a, a hub if you will um, for the volunteers to feel comfortable with and I think that that's incredibly important and um, you know, from where I stand, and I've, I've talked to Rhonda about this in terms of the community, uh, the best way to support your public schools, the best way to get community support in public schools is to get people involved in the public schools. Yeah. And the more people you get involved, the more support you're going to get. Right. And uh, so I think it's a snowball effect uh, that, that just, it's a phenomenon that just takes off just, just like a snowball. It just keeps yeah. getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because the more support you have, obviously the more support you're going to get for, uh, for the public schools. Um, a lot of your goals, uh, believe it or not, uh, um, mirror some of the goals of our uh, charitable contract. But we have a, a, a education foundation yes. uh, also in Wayham, and I think uh, some of your goals mirror that. So yeah. there might be an opportunity for us to look at both things yes, uh, simultaneously. We have one as well. yeah. um, so uh, I, 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 I'm really enthused about it. Uh, I feel good about it. Uh, I want to thank uh, you all for taking the time to come down. And speak to us, and I want to thank Rhonda for uh, bringing this to our attention. Could I just add something on the end? In what you were saying, they're housed in our in our public uh, at our high school. Vips has always been in one of our schools, so that makes them part of our school. It's not as if they are just in one room in an elementary school. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, quite an important place where their office is. So to handle that many people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the seriousness of it is that they have mm -hmm. they have their office at the high school now. Yeah. Yeah. So in thinking that, that makes them part of our community. Yeah. No, I, I think it's great. And, uh, also I'm glad to hear that from you. Also as a retired educator, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I can appreciate it. Good, thanks. All set? Yep, thank you. Jeff, one, one quick thing. Sure. I just want to give you credit and thank you for over 40 years of teaching. <laughs> That's uh, fantastic, yeah. and um, I'm the year sure was they. 1959. God bless <laughs> you. So now think how He was lucky 20 years I old know. in 1959. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, the the least important question I have is, I'm trying to understand. There's a 501c3. Yes. There's where? Uh, excuse me. Falmouth Public Schools. You work, you're a, an employee of Falmouth Public Schools. Correct. Is there a legal relationship between the 501c3 yes. and Falmouth, and what is it? Is there a contract? No, it, it's, we're actually, our 501c3, if you go deep, deep, deep down into the paperwork, we can only exist as a 501c3 because we're attached to Falmouth Public Schools, and I probably am not getting all that fancy lingo, right? When you say attached, are you um, a... We are a 501c3. Subsidiary of it's Falmouth like Public Schools? I think it's... Partner. No. no, we... Um, it's just sort of in the, the way the federal government structures, the IRS structures are w the way we can receive char charitable donations. But, but you're a... P the 501c3 is a part of, forget the legal terminology, mm -hmm. is a part of Falmouth Public Schools. No. I don't think it can be. No. no. I didn't think so either. It can't be. No. no. <coughs> but we we could not exist without Falmouth Public Schools. So I'm probably not, I wish I could no, give I you the terminology, but. Uh, maybe Dr. Rabinovich. I, I think that you are right. In order to be a 5013B C3. C3. You have to have a, you have to have a uh, public, or not a public, a Absolutely. charitable or a, a support uh, vehicle. And so Falmouth Public Schools would be that support. You are, you are working <coughs> to support Falmouth Public Schools, but you are, in fact, a corporation within yourself supporting right. Falmouth Public Schools. Yes. But in order to get that, you have to name some kind of beneficiary to, to your services. Yep. Am I right? That's right. Yes, that's one of the particular. Right. There are three or four different varieties right. of the 5013Cs, and one of them is an educational right. one. And... They're very precise about the ties. You can't be tied, um, but you can be supportive. And when you write the preamble in your constitution of the um, organization, th that's what ties you. 
you have to say what you're going to do, what you're going to support, mm -hmm. and that's where the charitable part comes. So that's the foundation for yes. Wareham Education. That's right. what we currently do. Right. Okay. S so I'm sitting here and I'm going to thank you question? more than <laughs> once. <laughs> <laughs> that was your easy question. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh, that no, that <laughs> wasn't it. <laughs> that, that was the least important question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and, and I'm going to do it more than once, but I want to th thank you very much for your time this evening. It's been um, enlightening, enjoyable, and, uh, and greatly appreciated, as well as to, to Liz and Rebecca for being here. Um, was, was there a time in your 29-year history where you almost failed? I, I really can't answer that because I'm kind of the new kid on the block. I'm the second director, and I've been here since 06. Was so there a time, then let me ask it a different way. Did, was there a certain number of years before you felt that you had a critical mass, enough momentum that it essentially be, became a part of the culture of, of Falmouth and Falmouth Public Schools? I mean, that obviously it couldn't always have it been so. And how long did it take for it to become embedded into the culture of the school district? Okay. Well, before I spoke with Rhonda, we were talking with the folks in New Bedford. They brought 10 people to Falmouth and <laughs> asked us questions for two hours. Um, so in preparation for that, I went through some of the old paperwork and notes and minutes. And I honestly, other than just starting with eight and then building to like 15 and then 30, it really took off because of that year. They spoke to everyone. They did focus groups. They did surveys. They really did their homework. That's the planning team That's that you're That's the planning team about. I was talking about. Okay. One whole year. But that was before anyone was coming into the schools. Yeah. If you already have volunteers in your school systems, you're already Ahead. beyond where yeah. they started. No one went into schools in yeah. 1983 or 1982. Yeah. Okay, uh, next. I know you're obviously you, you talked about the fact that you're competing for dollars, and as a part of a number of not-for-profits, I understand that that's the nature of yep. of the not-for-profit world. Um, do you find yourself also competing with other organizations? As I go around the schools to PTA meetings, school council meetings, etc., it's very clear that there's there are th there's a core group of volunteers already within Wareham, and it's, you know, they talk about, you know, 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. I yeah. think it's probably more like 5% of the people doing 95% of the work. <laughs> um, but do you find yourself, did you essentially absorb those people, or did you find new people, or both? Um. Meaning those, some of those people already exist, and, and I, we have two examples yes. right now. Yeah. Um, so did, did you end up absorbing their energy because every community has, has, a, has a finite amount of energy, or did you literally create new energy as oh. a part of this effort? In the beginning, I think we created new energy. Today, what we do is we partner. So um, the PTO, for example. Up. Oh, P okay, so that's interesting. So we're kind of like an umbrella. So the PTOs are going to exist because they're fundraising for very specific things like field trips, like computers, like um, you know, smart boards and things, very specific school-based things. So we do not, we try very hard not to compete with any of their fundraising efforts. Like we're never going to sell cookie dough. <laughs> we're never going to have a bake sale. We, we let them thrive in doing what they want to do for their school. We're sort of the bigger picture the umbrella where the folks who work on the PTO, that 5% that has all that energy, they are sort of outstanding volunteers. They're part of our family. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who volunteers in Falmouth Public Schools, whether it's for an hour or 20 hours a week, is a VIPS volunteer. Do they, how would they react to the idea that they're under your umbrella? We, I, don't, I wouldn't say under, <laughs> say <laughs> part of. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I actually had to deal with that when I first took this job because there was a little bit of a disconnect before, but I came in as a parent, as an active parent volunteer, and I didn't ever feel like I was part of the club. So I quick, we qu kind of quickly got rid of all those things and said, no, we're actually all one big 
family. So it, do, it can happen where people feel like, oh, what is this entity trying to come in and sort of oversee us? So in that case, we would, we would invite those people to be on the planning team. We would, I partner with everybody because my feeling is why exclude, exclude or why exactly. compete when you can actually do it better possibly together? So we've done a lot of things. Where I've written grants now with Falmouth Human Services, with the folks from PAL. Um, are we competing for the same dollars for these local bank grants? Yeah, but if we can do it together, they see the kids after school, I see them during the school day. So we've started, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not really, I don't like animosity and confrontation, so we try to find a way that people can feel like their contribution is part of something bigger. And in the end, it's for Falmouth Public School students. I must yes. Say something. Yes. I think that you deal with you deal with that, whatever it could be, through communication and like she said, um, going in and, and having a plan for what you think you can do to supplement the things that are already going on or to you know but also to work with each one of the existing groups to under to ask for their feedback on really what this should be. Because the thing is, is that if the, I've been to all of those PTAs and, and what I've heard is they need more, they need help, they need, you know, and, and they're not doing what this could be doing. Their responsibility is not getting more volunteers in the public school system. Their job is to do fundraising efforts, at least right now. Many of them are focused on fundraising efforts, which is very different than what this is. And so, again, I can see going forward that absolutely there could be some confusion, I wouldn't even call it tension, some confusion around how this is going to be different or the same as <coughs> the existing programs. We have to, with that group, we have to make sure that transparency and we are absolutely communicating, including those folks into the process instead of just putting this focus on top of them. I must say one of the most attractive things you said during your presentation to me that resonated with me was the fact that my perception is that there is an unfortunate, I guess I'll call it what I, th what I think it is, intimidation factor between parents and the school. Mm -hmm. uh, for the life of me, I don't understand it, perhaps because of my nature, it's, I'm not intimidated very easily, but it's very clear that it exists. And if you're playing a vital role in essentially eliminating intimidation from getting in the way of people volunteering and, and, and feeling impactful and useful and taking, uh, having channeling their energy, I think that in and of itself is fabulous. And even though I am the chair, I feel like I could go on for a long time and, and this guy would probably nudge me. So <laughs> I'm going to thank you again Absolutely. Uh, for, for a, a great presentation. You have uh, hopefully created some momentum in Wareham to do something something similar. We promise to honor the tips you have given uh, <laughs> because I, I suspect they are very wise um, and uh, I hope we can continue to talk as we as we progress in our thinking. And thank you again to, to Liz and Rebecca for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't yes. know if it's appropriate or not, but um, sorry to spring this on you, but as we were going That's not allowed. <laughs> oh, uh oh. No um, surprises. I'm wondering if I, um, I'd like to make a motion for this committee's approval uh, for um, an exploratory committee um, to see if this is uh, something that we would like to have in Wareham and um, that exploratory committee would come back and, and present to this group um, Wareham specific information. I, I, I take it you're volunteering to chair this committee. I am. <laughs> Um, so we have a motion on the table. I'll accept the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm in favor of Rhonda. <laughs> <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> abstained? It passes. And uh, I assume you'll re be recruiting some, assi some assistance. I will report back to the board with, uh, with who, um, how that selection process would go again. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. You have an esteemed guest with you there, Mark.
Kevin. <laughs> you know he's a, you know he's a tennis player. He is. Yes. I thought he wrestled. Yeah, uh, he's got to, he's got to work on his serve though. Jeff, the, his his guest <laughs> sees me all the time at physical therapy for the last 28 years. <laughs> I, ho I hope he's giving and not getting. <laughs> you can almost do the field goal. Welcome, Mark. Oh, I know. And Kevin. How are you guys? The floor is yours. And we're here for our concussion policy that the state has uh, mandated that all schools in Massachusetts, and um, I forwarded, I believe, a copy. And the um, policy has a, has a purpose, and it's, it's a pre-participation requirement training that we ask each and every one of our athletes, parents, and coaches uh, to, go, to, uh, to go through, and, and I keep the paperwork on that. And that's done by completing a course on www.nflslearn.com, and, and that, that, that is a course that's about 20 minutes long. It's done online. It's, you print a certificate that you have done uh, taken the course, and it kind of educates you on what to look for in case of a concussion and when there's a concussion, what do you do with it from there. Uh, once a, a student athlete is, is considered to have a concussion, we have an exclusion from, uh, from play, and that's when they, uh, they immediately see the attention of a physician, and then the physician, uh, when they're non-symptomatic, will... Uh, give Kevin the okay, and I'll let Kevin speak on his behalf in a minute, to go ahead and do a gradual return to play. And Kevin will explain that in one second. Um, and then once that's done, um, physician has to clear, and everybody, everything's <coughs> in here, the physician has to clear the athlete uh, to, to be able to come back and participate in athletics and or any other activity. When a kid has a bad concussion, they don't want you doing anything. Um, and then our athletic director, my athletic director responsibilities is that uh, we, uh, I myself participate <coughs> in the annual review and revision. I take the course every year as well. The athletic director completes, uh, completes the annual online training. The athletic director shall ensure the training of coaches, staff, parents, volunteers, and students. There's a sign-off sheet that I have that uh, on our consent form that states each student athlete and parent has completed the course. They sign off that they have done so. Uh, all the coaches uh, certify, get certified, and I keep those uh, certified forms in my file, and they're not allowed to coach until it's completed. And then the, uh, I also ensure medically cleared lists is provided to all coaches, assistants, and volunteers. No students participates without clearance. Once a concussion is, uh, is, is, is deemed, then, then Kevin does, does his work, and then once the physician clears them, then we allow them back on the field, and we ensure that athletes are prohibited from engaging in any unreasonable, dangerous athletic activity um, that would be in the health or danger of the athlete, including using a helmet or any other sports equipment as a weapon. We ask our coaches to educate uh, their kids uh, on how to tackle correctly, and, and you know we spend three days of non-contact in sports like football and things like that, where that is supposed to be form fit tackling, head up. Don't use your helmets as weapons in hockey or anything like that. And you're seeing that in the pro game right now, that there's uh, severe penalties for using your helmet as a, as a weapon of any sort. So, Kevin is, uh, once the kid has a concussion, Kevin then puts them through, and he does a great job with this. I mean, I've watched him, and he's very, very thorough with, with how he treats the athlete, and, 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 and he does a, what they call a graduate turn to play once they're non-symptomatic. And if Kevin, you want to explain that for so when an athlete uh, is suspected of a concussion, whether they go helmet to helmet or whatever the case may be, um, if a concussion is suspected, they're removed from play. Upon further uh, assessment by myself, if they show signs and symptoms of a concussion, uh, at that point I'm going to uh, fill out this form. This is the uh, acute concussion evaluation form. This is what I use. This is what South Coast Hospital has decided to use with their athletic trainers. This I fill out, I send the kid to the doctor because I need to consult with a physician as part of the uh, Department of Public Health guidelines. On the back they have our plan of care that I'm going to have signed off saying, you know, athlete may start the gradual return to play uh, once they're asymptomatic for 24 hours. Physician signs that. I monitor the kid as uh, every day. Once they're asymptomatic for 24 hours, they start each process. It's a seven-step process that I do. Um, 
every step is different. It doesn't specify what your return to play is. This is what I'm comfortable with. An athlete may not move on to the next step until they can complete said step without uh, resumption of symptoms. So it starts off with something very light and then it gets uh, intense as the steps go on. And then I use this form for that, but once they are getting close to the end here, uh, we make another appointment where the athlete, I give them the uh, post-concussion form by the DPH, send them back to the doctor for final clearance, and then once the uh, physician is satisfied, they come back, that's signed, kid is good, good to go. Any questions? Oh, yes. Okay. Rhonda. Um, I head up the policy review committee, and unfortunately we weren't able to uh, look at this policy and discuss it in length because we didn't have a, a quorum, but there were a couple um, issues that popped up um, that, um, that I just wanted to ask about. Um, one is the beginning, it talks about um, each one of the students having to complete an online form. There was yep. concern that um, not every student has access um, or household has access. Um, what uh, is there discussion of adding an opportunity in there to have it taken some uh, some other way? In our um, concussion policy, we've stated that if a student athlete does not have access to a computer, um, that we will provide that uh, at the school for them uh, after hours. So we, we will we'll have a day um, that there's that there's students that that are not allowed to take it, they can, they can go to the computer lab with their coach. In fact, in Plymouth, we, we did it for the entire first week. We had one coach who was at the computers monitoring that to make sure that they completed the course. Okay. So where is it in the actual policy? I'm um, sorry. Yeah, it's in the mask. Wait. Wait. Let me see that. Yeah, it, in the policy that we have in front of us and the one that we had, it, it, it didn't talk about that so arrangements will be made with the athletic director for internet access in the event that is not available to the parent guardian the second where it says pre-participation requirement training first paragraph last sentence what any yeah the first paragraph last sentence yeah the ours doesn't read that ours says this requirement um, it ends with this requirement may be met by completing the online course and providing a cert certificate of completion so we might not have gotten an updated one but the one that we okay. have in our packet doesn't include this was forwarded, I think, maybe Monday I forwarded the, the, the first one that we gave was a draft, and then after hearing comments, we revamped yeah. it to the like next one. I, I can forward it to That's you in I the morning. Please. Do you have one? Yeah. Yeah, we, we don't have the most updated one. Okay. Michelle, didn't you, because you completed for me that um, comparison between the two policies. All right, as soon as Rhonda is, okay. yeah, are you all set? Um, the only other one was just the whole section about communication to the parent. And right now it does read that, you know, communicating to the parent, so the child has sustained an injury that we think is a concussion and that the parent is notified after the practice or after the that game. That's my question. Is it? Yeah. Sorry, I should go, just No, no, go. go ahead, go ahead. That's a good question. Um, I have a problem with that. <laughs> Um, that see. that we're not communicating immediately. Um, I can understand that the coach needs to stay there, but a, a designee or someone is communicating. If a if a parent isn't there, that that if a child has sustained a head injury, that we are communicating immediately to the parent. What I've been doing, whether it's a practice or a game, is I've contacted the parent right away. Okay, that's been be my practice. Okay. Um, the the way that it's written into the DPH regs, it doesn't say that the athletic trainer is responsible. It says the coach is responsible because not every school has an athletic trainer. What I've been doing with every kid is, let's say, take football for instance. Kid gets hit, kind of is woozy. I remove him from play. I monitor him throughout that, and then after the game, provided they haven't gone south or gotten more symptomatic, I do a much more formal a vow, and then I call the parent, where I say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, this is what happened. Please monitor him. 
or her. Uh, if it's happened at a practice, it's usually right away. I take the kid in. Okay, you know, John Doe, call. let's go call your parents. I think you've had a concussion. It's pretty much been right away uh, if it's a parent. But a, a concussion is kind of a progressive type of thing where the kid can get worse as, as you go on or, or less. So it's not Right, if they get better or if they get worse, I think you're probably here from, from us that, well, I'll only speak for myself, that um, I feel that if – if the injury is serious enough that we have to pull the kid out of the game right. and we're monitoring them, I don't care if it even gets better, I would want the parent contacted immediately and I would want that written into the policy. But I'll, I'll let my other committee members speak. That's that? Yep, those are the comments that I have. Thank you. I can speak to the same thing. Um, I've, I've been a coach and my three children are athletes, and there are enough assistants or designees uh, at a, uh, a practice or a game um, that makes contacting the parent not that difficult. So um, I don't think that this would be a very difficult thing to do, and I absolutely agree with Rhonda. If my child was suspected of having a concussion or some kind of a head injury, I would want to know right away so that I could make a decision as to what I wanted to do in terms of my, my child. So I don't think I don't think it will be an imposition. I don't think it will be anything that can't be done. And I think that that language should be inserted into the policy. I, I will not approve the policy without that language. In where, there. where would you like it inserted? Right there where they've got a coach shall communicate the nature of the industry direct injury injury directly to the parent in person or by phone immediately after the practice of communication. I just take that sentence right out of there and put immediately, period. Coach or his designee. So just immediately to be clear, take after just the practice of completion. Just right. to be clear, we're talking about the third bullet and you're, and you're recommending the deletion of after the practice or competition. That's correct. In which the student has been removed from play. So it's just immediately um, in which this Immediately after the student has been removed from play. After the immediately. Just reword. Just get rid of the practice or. Com or it doesn't com quite work well to do that. No, just say a parent will be. Immediately uh, after, after a, a student, student has, has been removed, removed from, from play. play. Period. Yeah. So you're deleting the, the practice or competition yes, in yes, which yes. a. Okay. So we're deleting after the practice or competition. Or competition in which, right, and we're inserting the word after instead of. Well, if you leave after and just demit the practice or com competition in which. Michelle, why don't you read what you've got if if you're ready? Fine. Due to a head injury, et cetera. Yes, the after is after immediately. Okay. You all set, Cliff? Yep. Yep. Ken? I'm, I'm all set. Okay. Um, I sh go ahead. I'm um, just for process. Can we put coach or designee? Do you have that, Michelle? The coach or designee. So after the word coach, you want and designate. Yeah, because if in the middle of the game, the coach, you know, yeah. he'll send somebody to make the call or whatever, but That's I don't know if he has to yeah. do it personally. Okay. Okay. Just as process, um, the information on this, um, we got the sample things on December 9th from Mass Association of School Committees. Um, today, and I haven't even had a chance to read it, one came from the Superintendents Association at our January meeting that's going to be discussed. So the law says we have to, I have to affirm that we have a policy, but it is a preliminary policy and it doesn't have to be affirmed, so to speak, until March 2012. So my thought is if we approve tonight, then as new information comes in, we can then bring it back to policy review with the new information and the current one, and then if anyone wants to make any further that's fine. Um, yeah, this, things. this is a draft. That's correct. It's not technically due until March. 
It's right, an but we have to policy. right. We have yeah, to have yeah. an interim. Okay, that's that's fine. Because um, football season is over for, and you know hockey is we're in the middle of. Point of clarification. So is yes. a motion in order? Not yet, okay. but but it will be. Point of clarification, but Mr. Dr. Rabinovich, approval, but you're okay with us approving it with the change that we just talked y about? Yes. All right, I just want to make sure that you weren't saying approve it as is. No, okay. no, 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 with the change. Thanks. There's one more change, too, that, that on our end, um, and after which is returned to play, the last sentence says, if an athlete has two concussions with a <coughs> within a 30-day period, he or she will sit out the remainder of the season, not year. So we, we would like... And that's my own policy that I've practiced ever since I've entered the athletic training field. Because in other words, a student athlete could get their second concussion within the first two weeks of the season, and the following winter season uh, may be healthy enough to participate. If a doctor says that they're healthy enough to participate, then they can return to play for that season. See, I put year, I meant season. I just misworded it. It's still up to the physician to release the, the that's right. student. That's right, always. Y yeah. yeah. It's not, it, there's no one but the physician can yeah. clear. I think it should say season and not year. That's fine. Yeah. Did you get okay. that? Okay. I, I'm trying to, uh, I'm putting on my coaching hat now, and I'm trying to imagine all these people that are going to have to be trained. Um, and now I'm, I'm thinking specifically, uh, we can get all the students in a room and, and put a computer in front of them and I'm thinking that even then it might be a real good idea to, to do that as a group to, because kids forget, they don't show up, etc. But I'm trying to imagine also getting parents trained. And is it true that under this policy that if we don't have something that shows that a parent has been trained then and not just a signature but an actual certificate then that child is not going to be allowed to play the sport? No. Uh, it's not manda it's mandated that the parent, if the parent signs off, I have on our consent form saying, I have completed the online concussion course. I give the, I give the uh, website and athlete signature, parent signature. The parent signs off that they have completed that course. But they don't actually ever have to prove it. No, I, I think it would be <laughs> impossible to bring Bishop Thang did the same thing. Everyone, put everyone. It in student Plymouth, handbook. I, before I wrote this up, I went to, I called the numbers of Plymouth. Everyone does it where they, if a parent's willing to sign that they have taken the course, I mean, I don't think we can micromanage every single parent that's playing sports that they. So a student took has to prove it. Yes? No, a student has to sign off that they have taken the course. Okay. Coach, has to, to coach the course. has to prove it. Coach has to prove it. So coach, staff, anybody who's employed under the control of, so to speak, yes. the school district. So that they're aware of the symptoms. So yeah. parents and students are just asked to sign that they've taken it. That's correct. It does seem to me that we ought to at least perhaps facilitate that. Um, I think I, it's impossible. I really do. I think, I think you're looking at... You no, no, no. Let me finish, please. I don't mean insist on it by, by anything that we don't, can't control, but you've done a great job with things like captain's nights, right? It seems to me that if we showed the film at that time, because basically it's a film, um, somehow got this program, took a, an intermediate step, because I'm very concerned that that signature ultimately is going to mean nothing. From my discussions with my fellow athletic trainers with the hospital group, um, Bishop Stang, athletic trainer Kathy Thornton, she's been big on this. She's been the one that's keeping all of us in the hospital up to date on it. And she's spoken with the DPH and she's figured out everything that we've needed to do as far as athletic trainers ne are concerned and as far as what we need to do with the pre-participation and, and the post forms and what forms to use and all the communication. They are putting the onus on the parents and the athletes to get that education done on their own because I think they're all in agreement that it's almost impossible to get all that proof. So it's just like signing any other document that you're saying, yes, I've done this. And if they say, well, I didn't know, and then you, well, yes, you did because you signed. I know what you're saying is that they may or may not do it, but we need to 
I think you need to put some responsibility on those people because I don't disagree with that at all. I just I think just, to I the just extent don't see that we how we can do it. There's there's enough paperwork that's going along with this that it's I have we have mountains of it. I'm not talking about adding any paperwork, just to be clear. But okay. There's also a um, form that the kids have to sign. I mean, that the parents have to sign out on the student athlete. Uh, it's called a pre-participation head injury concussion report and form, which is in our uh, policy here. Uh, that states whether or not they've ever had a concussion. So we can track how many kids have had previous concussions, and Kevin keeps it on file. So let's say a kid is in the, in the middle of a competition, has a concussion. Kevin can look at the file and say, oh, boy, last season you also had a concussion. Now we're dealing with two. We let the doctor know, and it's treated differently. So th there's a – I mean, I, I think that – I think we've done about as much as we possibly could to – make sure we're protecting the, the student athlete, um, particularly with Kevin. Kevin does a great job. I mean, I oh, that's dealt with a lot I of trainers, and I understand. he Cliff. doesn't let the kid back on. Go ahead, Cliff. Um, I, I kind of agree with, uh, with the folks uh, down there in, in terms of uh, onus of responsibility. You know, we leave ourselves wide open. If we take on the responsibility of providing a forum in which this training takes place, and we also run the risk of being accused of not going far enough and not having the training good enough. I think that if we put the onus of responsibility squarely on the parent where it belongs, uh, we first of all, we can't be accused of not going far enough because it's not our responsibility. It's the parent's responsibility because the signature indicates to us that the parent has fulfilled that responsibility and that duty and has signed off on the fact that they've taken the course. So uh, I... I I've, I've spoken about this issue several times, not about the head injury, but about, you know, taking on all of the duties that belong squarely in the hands of the family. And uh, I think that this is one of them. Certainly we're going to do everything within our power to ensure that a kid is not playing hurt. But ultimately, uh, the parents have to understand that they have to be aware of their responsibility uh, in terms of academics as well as athletics. And I think it's just, uh, we just can't take it all on. So uh, I think that uh, what you recommend, I would support what you recommended. And I don't think that we should get into the, the, the training business for parents uh, at this point in time, because it leaves us all wide open for the criticism that we didn't go far enough. That's just my opinion, Jeff. And I do it, at meet the, meet the coaches night, I, I spend time in front of all the parents and the athletes uh, discussing the importance of it, to sit down together and take the course and before you sign consent forms and things like that, you know, that, that you did. I mean, like you said, I mean, I don't, to, to manage every parent and to make sure they take the course, and I, I just don't know if there's enough. Fair enough. Uh, Michelle, could you give back to the committee all of the changes so that we can incorporate it into an amendment? Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> I told you we'd be hearing from you. That third bullet, I think, is the one that's in yeah. question. Yeah, the code to designate shall communicate. Right. Which starts with Just the coach and you're going to put or designate. Right. Yes. Add that one. Um, on that third bullet, then we're going to put a takeaway the practice or competition in which, and we're going to just say immediately after a student has been removed from play. Okay. And then we're also going to add under return to play, take out year, and put season. Okay. That's the only one I have. That's it. Does it anybody have anything else? You, got, you guys good with those changes? That's good, yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just... Um, as a high school referee, 200 of us, we all had to take the online concussion tests and produce a certificate um, to the board or you wouldn't be able to officiate any games. I sort of lean towards what Jeff is saying, at least for the, the players, is I, I, I think you could actually have, if you have the football team, you could have them in one room. Players. Yeah. Right, you can have them in one room and show this PowerPoint, uh, the presentation to them, and then when they leave the room, they can sign off. They can sign off on that. Um, but I just have a problem with the athlete themselves just 
signing off and saying that they have done this. I think if you have um, someone like the trainer in the room for any questions or, or anything and you show it, I, I don't see why that can't be done. Well, frankly, as a coach, I may, I may do it not to change the policy, but just to augment and reinforce right. the policy. And I assume, Mark, you wouldn't have any problem with a coach doing that. I wouldn't be altering it. I'd just be reinforcing it. You wouldn't have to do it with every sport because naturally it, it, it runs year to year, correct? Yeah, right. Once a year, yeah. Right. So you just want coaches to speak on the nature of concussion signs and symptoms with their athletes? Let's face it. There are days when we can't practice. <laughs> well, that is true. So I'm not... They'd still be signing the form. Everything would be according to the policy. But if I took a rain date that I couldn't be on the courts and, and reinforced this by, by making sure they understood the importance of concussions, I don't think I'm doing any harm. Mark, you're hesitant. Uh, I'd rather see you practice, honestly, if you're thinking oh, of Oh, no, no. I'd rather be at practice every day of the week. Of an, of an athletic director's standpoint because I think that I, mean, I honestly think that it's it's become to the point where we're going over the top with it. If 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 a pair, I know my wife took the course because the, she had to sign off in Plymouth that my daughter was playing the sport, and my daughter also took it too. And I think we have to, as adults, say to the parents and to the, you know, it's your responsibility as well to sit down with your student athlete. This is important stuff. I mean, it's the health of your child to make sure that you're taking the course. And the, the thing about that is that you have to do it before the season. So if they sign off that they took the course and then you went ahead two weeks later and had them retake the course, I mean, I, I don't know what benefit you get out of that because okay. they, they had to sign they already did it. Enough said. That's you know fine. What I mean? um, we ha we I'll take a motion as a for the policy as amended. So moved. Second. Well, I was going to... For discussion, second. Second. Okay. I was going to say the motion a little bit differently. Okay. How did you want to rephrase it? I, I was going to uh, make the motion to accept this tentative draft policy uh, I until, think uh, until uh, which time we can vote on a more permanent policy. I think they're looking for the use of the word interim, if you don't mind. Well, interim, fine. That's fine. Okay. But I, by the, the way the motion was stated, it doesn't say that. And I think it's important okay. to have that in there. Would you withdraw your motion? Yes. Okay. What so if I, excuse me for a minute, w what if I, um, you made a good point when you said uh, meet the parents tonight. What if I set up something to meet the parents tonight every season with all the athletes and parents are there, some kind of video of some sort, I'll call the state or I'll call the board and play that as my introduction into Parents Night and say, this is something that we're, and, and then, and then I'll, I'll, I'll reinforce taking the course on your own, signing off that you had done so, but this will give them a preliminary into that. Mark, that's great. You can do that, but it doesn't have to be in this yes. policy. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, that's, as long as, that's, yeah, but that's just something that we can do in Wareham to right. help okay. out. Uh, Cliff, we've got the motion withdrawn. You're withdrawing your second. Would you make the motion now the way you feel comfortable with it? I'm, I move that we accept the policy as a, this policy presented to us this evening as amended as an interim uh, policy uh, for, con uh, for concussion of uh, student athletes. Second. Second. Okay. Third. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Four zero zero. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. And let's hope we don't have to use it. Are you dizzy? You feel nauseous? Tiny's coming. We gotta keep going. Anna, <laughs> she's coming. <laughs> Anna Miranda, come on down. Would you like to do the master the advanced one? Because I need to set up set one. Excuse me? Yes, we can do the master plan. If, yes, if that please, is okay with you. Please Fine, thank you. Go ahead, Barry. Okay, in your package, there is a document. Um, this was the RFI that we sent out. 
uh, request for qualifications for Wareham Public Schools master plan study. Um, approximately every 10 years, the district should um, have a master plan done of its facilities um, to let you know about things that need to be done to the facilities to keep them um, current. And at the same time, this does a space needs study from an educational point of view. It looks at square footage and what um, the state believes you should have versus what you have. Um, the purpose for this now is that it is a first step before you do a feasibility study for the um, school building authority. And when we had the walkthrough uh, from the MSBA, uh, they asked us about this and we said to them, we had put out an RFI and they said we should continue down that path, it would help uh, the process. So um, what I'm, I'm here asking you to put together a, um, I'm going to look at my, to an appointment of a designer selection committee for the Wareham Public School Master Plan. Uh, I am recommending uh, the following composition uh, for the selection committee. Uh, the superintendent, um, one member of the school board, um, one member of the finance board, um, oh, excuse me, the director of operations and finance, one member of the finance committee, one member of the capital planning committee, um, one local builder, um, and one local architect. This mirrors um, a school building committee um, that I worked on for the uh, building of the middle school. And uh, these are people who um, would have some expertise when we look through the um, proposals. Um, we currently, I think, um, have eight proposals that came in that need to be um, looked at. We first have to come up with a rubric in order to um, grade them. To dis um, and then after that process, we would bring, this committee would look at it, make a recommendation, we bring the recommendation back to this board and ask for this board to approve appointing whichever group um, is successful as the uh, group that will do the master plan. Okay, so what you're looking for is a motion to approve the formation of a designer selection committee? Yes, sir. Okay. With the following um, and is composition. It, right. And is it accurate to say that the formation of the designer selection committee in and of itself would not need a budget? That is correct. Okay. Any questions before we move on this? Yes. We did this 10 years ago? Um, <coughs> probably 20 years ago was the last 20. one that we did. That was complete. The one that we did 20 years <coughs> ago, is that what gave us the information needed to um, submit the information to the state to get mine it? No, it's the one we used <coughs> when we did the middle school project. Um, we used, when you um, turn in information to the state requesting a building to be done, you have to give them information. So the 20 year one was updated with the information that we had available to us, um, but it wasn't professionally done. And do we know generally if we do move forward what a cost for something like this is? Yes, I have encumbered a certain amount of money in our um, choice account to pay for this um, after meeting with an architect and getting some ballpark figures. Do you have generally what it cost last time or what we would be looking at? I do not, I really don't know 20 years ago what it cost. Well, how much have you encumbered? <coughs> this couldn't cost depending on what the committee asks them to do. Uh, there's a negotiation. This is not like um, a low bid thing where mm -hmm. you come out and you say, all right, open There's up the bid and it goes to that. 
So there's a range, and the range could be between 20,000 and 40,000, depending on what you're looking at. If you recall, when we were looking to do the study of the Everett Center, I was looking for approximately $10,000 to do it for one building. Um, because you're talking about specialists that need to come in and um, do some, particularly when it comes to the older facilities and what they need. You all set? Yeah, I mean, I have an opinion. It's not a question. You want to share it? Well, I, I absolutely think that information is key, especially when it comes to our buildings and um, and that this information will be useful to this committee as well as to the community on how we fare compared to other schools um, when it comes to the educational environment that we're providing for our students. Um, so I would love that we would have an opportunity to gain this information. I'm glad that there isn't a decision that needs to be made on a budget right now and that, again, I, I think that I would still approve the formation of this committee um, but I think that we really need to look at our budget year to see if this is something that we would actually go forward and do this year. Um, but I think that that, I don't think that would change my vote on forming the committee. Ken? I'm all set. Cliff? I'm all set. Um, I, I just want to say that unfortunately I find myself sitting here once again doesn't have any influence on my vote on this particular issue. But I find myself sitting here not wanting to spend any money that I know is a precursor to a lot more money for which there is not necessarily consensus and support within the community to, to do. Uh, either because there are different agendas or because there just isn't the money and no one wants to take the actions necessary. We all know that it took three votes um, to get the middle school project going and that was 89 cents on the dollar. We have no illusions that anything associated with mine and forest is going to be 89 cents on the dollar. It's probably going to be more like, what, 50 cents on the dollar, 60 cents on the dollar, something like that. So I am, I'm not happy with the fact that I'm sitting here feeling this way. Uh, but I just want you to know that I'm, I, I think it behooves the leadership of this town, the, all of the leadership of this town, to get on the same page with respect to um, the standards that we have for um, how we provide services, and that certainly includes schools. Um, and right now I'm not sure we are. But having said that, um, I will take a motion on the on the formation of a designer selection committee uh, with the composition as outlined by the superintendent. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. It passed. And um, what is the process by which we will uh, pick those is that something I'm going to send a letter to each of the chairs of the various committees asking them to find somebody that would be willing to serve okay. for them to appoint. I understand. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Anna, you ready? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, before I do my financial report, I just wanted to share a couple of things with the committee. Um, one, to acknowledge um, the conclusion of our school supply drive, the Cape Verdean school supply drive, we were able to ship five containers, huge barrel containers full of school supplies. Um, within this community, we collected over 1,200 items. I'm uh, just so impressed, so uh, grateful uh, for the generosity of, of all the folks that came out, you know, whether it was through monetary donation or the actual supplies. I um, would also like to acknowledge Staples for donating over $250 worth of teacher, um, you know, really good teacher materials that those, those teachers would need. And um, sometime this week, it's going to be a very merry, merry Christmas in Cape Verde because the um, ship, the left 
around December 7th and is anticipated to get there sometime the end of this week. Um, I'm <coughs> sure we'll have, um, you know, photos and, and just news and great news to share with you once they do receive it and they send us stuff. Um, and last but not least, I really want to acknowledge the Cape Verde Festival Committee, um, not only for their um, graciousness in letting us set up a booth, you know, to roll this thing out back in August, and also for a, a very generous donation that helped us to be able to meet the shipping costs and, you know, to purchase the barrels and to do all of that. So again, um, obrigado. Um, the other thing is, I, I had some fun today, and I want to kind of share it with folks. I don't have a lot of fun nowadays. In what? The <laughs> <laughs> I don't anymore. Um, I had the opportunity to go over to the multi-service center um, at the senior center, and this morning the Dicus uh, Chorus uh, went there and, and performed and gave a wonderful, wonderful little holiday show for the seniors, and then did a sing-along and. You know, they were really uh, grateful, and I just want to acknowledge the uh, uh, Mrs. Panarisi and Mr. Hart, the uh, music teacher, and, um, and our seniors, and, and our kids. They were just great. They were absolutely great. Okay, with those two things done, um, as you can see by the number of schedules up on your table, um, the financial report really doesn't have... Um, it's, it's rather benign because um, we really don't have much of a change since the last financial report. Um, the bottom line, we're looking at about a half a percent difference uh, between where we were last year and this year. Um, basically, so I'd like to maybe just go through and just highlight the things that um, I want to bring to your attention. And then if you have questions, you can then um, have some questions. Just a quick point of information. The I'm looking at 58... 68 and 6130. Mm -hmm. Those are different numbers than I'm looking at on the, the PDF that Michelle sent us. Is there a reason why they should be slightly different? No. Different dates? I have the same, I have the same numbers on this PDF. Which one did you want yeah. this one? Yeah. They were looking at this particular Oh, you're looking at the summary. Okay. Yes, because they, they don't have that. I don't. Oh, yes, they do oh, no, on they the do. second page. Yeah. Um, on this one, Jeff. So well, this, this because is what, what I do with um, is this. this, this is I'm looking at something page. called the Wareham Public Schools Monthly Financial Report. Right, but if you go to... Um, Shouldn't they be the same numbers? Wareham Public School Monthly Financial Report, I think, maybe roll up different... No, 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 that's... Right. together. No, I'm looking no. at that one. You're looking at that one? That one. Oh, okay. Okay, you're looking at the, um, the, the end figure. LEA right. net total. Okay. Is that 5868, the LEA net, LEA net total? No, only for administration, only for these functions. Okay, go ahead. This only for those functions, Fine. not for the end. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and I've explained previously, you know, we're going to see that difference in district leadership for a bit because of... Um, uh, different amounts in what we've expended in terms of contract services from last year to this year. Um, that's pretty uneventful. Uh -oh. You're right. Uh, they're the same. Sorry, my yeah. fault. Okay. Um, instructional leadership, uh, again, you know, the department heads curriculums, because of the restructuring, we went from 10 to 13. So you really see the a little bit of a difference there. Teaching and other teaching services, we're looking at, at less than less than a half of, of a percent variance in terms of where we were last year and, and this year, and I think that tends to be the number I pay the most attention to is that uh, 2305 and 2310, which is really the bulk of our budget, um, looking at 72.87 now and 72.04 uh, prior year. So feeling good about that. Um, substitutes, did want to share that. Um, Last year at this time, we had expended $137,590. Um, currently, we have only expended 96824 So we saw a decrease the last month, so it's a nice pattern. We're definitely seeing a decrease in the teacher substitute line. How are you doing on the little mystery, though? Well, I think I um, found some of it. I believe that there's a certain amount of professional development substitute 
charges were charged to the regular account because there wasn't enough funding so i'm kind of getting having to dig through and and go Have through and find it um yeah okay so I'll that could be I'll one, one thing but, but that's not to say that's the whole thing who knows I'll stay tuned okay, okay. um this is there Uh, and the guidance, again, as we've explained previously, it's because of uh, positions that had to go back into the LEA that had been previously funded through ARA or through the Ed Jobs. Um, other student services, you're looking at a very, very slight, slight variance, uh, not much at all. Even in professional development right now, um, not much of a variance cumulatively. Uh, instructional materials, you see the variance because we actually, last year we had to hold on to textbook money for a lot longer to make the purchases at the end of the year once the teachers had made, you know, the decisions, the curricular decisions. Uh, this year, we, we've spent the money, um, more or less up front. In the operations and maintenance, looking at um, still um, heating, actually doing, doing better, as you can see. Um, utilities is still the biggest variance, looking at a 9.5%, uh, 54% percent variance. Um, in electrical, I'm not seeing it with the uh, telephone services. I've analyzed that. Um, it's some, some in water. There's basically our, our utility costs are uh, it's electric, uh, our phones, uh, water and I'm not uh, seeing it. I shared with uh, Mr. Fonts, I did um, some random sampling of last year, um, looked at uh, a January period, an April period, and then a November period, and looked at, and what we saw was there's been an increase in usage at the elementary schools and middle school, and also an increase in um, you know, uh, price per kilowatt. The high school is an anomaly. Um, it, their usage has actually gone down um, two of those periods, yet the costs have still increased. So again, it's just something we're just going to have to watch. And um, this is one of the warmest fall winters yeah. we've experienced. Are you surprised we're not more favorable on heating? Except oil is a million dollars a gallon. No. Uh, because you still, you know, that chill in the morning, you st we actually expend, I've been told, um, more when, we, when, we're, when we're turning everything on, you know, starting from that low point and then getting the building warm. So we're really not shutting, we have to get the, the cold out of the building. And so we're really not able to really shut the heat off or really tone it down till about 11, 12 o'clock. And again, that's if it's a, if it's a reasonable temperature outside. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, Anna, am I correct that didn't we move some money and trim some money in the heating accounts? Oh, we had because trimmed we it, yes, over? absolutely. From previous year, yeah. We moved uh, money prior available, if money. you go to your So you're saying we have a different denominator? Yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, for there. But again, we'll just watch it. Um, grounds, I've seen a little bit more of a um, spending, and again, I think because I saw we had a lot of tree removal uh, costs because of the uh, storm. Um, we've had to repurchase the bleachers, so that was um, a, an, an additional almost $8,000 expenditure to the grounds budget. And, um, and Spillane Field needed uh, a little bit more in terms of work this year. So um, that's the reason why we've seen the increase in the grounds. Our insurance um, and uh, special ed tuition, again, um, uh, Mr. Lazan had has encumbered, so that's why you see that huge variance, 42 to 19 percent from last year to this year. The money's encumbered. That's why it, it basically that's the variance. Um, this, in summary, we're really only looking at a. If you're just looking at the LEA total, it's a 1.97 percent uh, difference. You go down to the non-net. Before we leave the LEA. Okay. I would have never caught this if I wasn't trying to figure out what the total would have been if we took out of district out because I knew of the unencumbered so I knew that the 19.75 was a distortion mm -hmm. 
But what I discovered, much to my surprise, is that the LEA total percentage of 58.96 is simply wrong. The math is wrong. It's 65 and some percent. Excuse me? Well, are you it's it's 65.90, not 58.96. So since I assume it's some formula that's built by this. It's embedded in the. Embedded yeah. in, how can that possibly be? How can you suddenly have it spit out the wrong number? But that's embedded. It's coming right out of our accounting program. And then that just makes me. Yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Please. Yeah. Where, where did you come up with the 65? Yeah, where, from here? I don't get that. No, I took the 16,733,401 okay, and divided it by the 25,397,94. All right, because this that says 6528, which is at the end, also has transportation in it. I understand right. that. Beca so. And that's exactly. And that's exactly why you wouldn't expect it to be 58. So the 58 is simply a miscalculation. And I would like you to find out how that can happen. You gotta love VADAR. <laughs> I'm not gonna Vader. love VADAR. I already don't it's like VADAR. It's our county system. If it's not VADAR, it's not VADAR. But yeah. I want it because every time I see a er number, an error like that, it makes me wonder where the other errors that I haven't caught are. Mm -hmm. So what are you saying it is, Jeff? What I'm saying know. is what, what, the what way they're getting. did you come up with? 65.9. Instead of 58.96? Right. Not close. No, it's not close. And yet, the six, and yet the other percentages are correct. I didn't test every one, but I tested a few. Right. Yeah. And so I don't know how that now happens. Could it? Barry has an answer. If you, if could it be the, the 470000 added these dollars? up and divided to get the average? It has the subtotal averages involved which would skew it, I believe. Well, that would be a very bad methodology if uh, that's uh, how I'm it's doing it. I, I don't know that, but I'm, that mm. would be my assumption. No. Anyway, okay. please find your... Yeah. First of all, I had Rhonda confirm it because I did it three times at home and I thought maybe I'm... <laughs> Rhonda confirmed <laughs> it, okay? So confirm it for yourself and I then, will. more importantly, find out how that happened. Yeah, how it does. Because that I lose confidence in the numbers when I find errors like that. Yeah. Like for example, I've had to I have to make that four hundred and seventy thousand six hundred sixty dollar adjustment every time we look at the custodial line. Because okay, at this point last year we had not um, we had not uh, uh, decreased the budget. So you're not really until we get to that point we're not really comparing the real figure. So like for example, let me go back to Well, I don't want to dwell on it. But in could the you go back to the total services? I don't want to dwell on it. Yeah. Keep go, go back to the totals. And what's so in the end, what concerns me... That could be part of it. In the end, what concerns me is it's true that, that we have 65% remaining, and last year we had 65% remaining. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't... 60%. Um, 60%. No, I'm, looking 6.54. I'm looking oh, at... 6.54. I'm looking at LEA and non-net. And non-net. Okay? Okay. I shouldn't say what concerns me. What's, what surprises me so. is that we actually are doing very well despite the fact yeah. that the... Uh, out of district is, you know, way. Well, it's just it's encumbered. I mean, event we we would have spent it. We're going to spend it. I we understand. Spent it last year, you know. I un I understand, but that actually creates a distortion because we 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 have so little for now. Yeah. For now, because we have so little left, so that actually that actually means we have quite a bit more somewhere else in order to get back to to be about the same for last year. Which is it's good news, you can but see it's surprising. It up and down depending upon yeah, upon which account. Okay, thank you. Go okay. ahead. Um, what I do want to the revolving accounts. Um, the only thing to bring to your attention is uh, in our insurance account, we um, are experiencing uh, vandalism and um, some um, difficulty at the Minot grounds and the Hammond School. Therefore, um, we're going to be um, installing surveillance cameras. We're going to be using um, ten, the 10000 that we received from that grant from the B-Safe that was in that insurance account um, because it would be a proper expenditure for that, those monies. It was tar you know, targeted to that. Um, and basically using that and then having to use two, two additional $1,000 of the Minot building maintenance budget and 1000 of the Hammond 
to put up these cameras. Um, we're having, um, we know groups are congregating. Um, you know, you see the, 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 the uh, telltale signs, you know, in the morning when the custodian's coming in. Um, really concerned at the ham and someone actually uh, cut, bolted, you know, just cut the chain and actually took the entire gate <laughs> off and the, the custodian found it somewhere down the road. Um, you know, and, and other just damage, you know, taking, tearing shingle off the, off the building and, and, you know, and, and tagging and all of that. So with the cameras, hopefully, and uh, I um, notified Officer Baptiste, our school resource officer, and once we do, we do have that access to be able to visibly, you know, um, um, catch that. Um, he will definitely assist us in um, dealing with the situation, okay? Um, the other thing with mine, it, um, the need for even additional cameras is because what we've seen is uh, Principal Siemens has brought to my attention that individuals are not going through the, they're avoiding going through the security gates at the Brandy Hill Apartments, which sort of border mine it, mine it. And on several occasions, she and her teachers have caught people just walking up through the mine it um, grounds and wanting to go cut through the, um, the back and the playground to cut mm -hmm. over to Brandy Hill. Exactly right. yep. So we've, we've got some concerns about that and definitely um, mm -hmm. we're going to be positioning that. cameras where we can catch that. I've um, approached the school resource officer as well as our fire department and uh, we, we are going to set up a meeting um, with, the, with Brandy Hill to discuss it. Um, someone said they may also have some cameras coming this way as well, so we'll have to get together and, and kind of uh, do that. But I did want to let the committee know that that is something that's going on operationally that's not good. Um, the About that side? Yeah. 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 One second. Go ahead. So I wanted to go a little bit further on um, whether, how much we're engaging law enforcement. I know that we're contacting our resource officer, and I know that that person is to be the liaison with the police department, but um, for incidents where, because I, I was at uh, one of the PTAs or I don't know, one of the principal's coffee where um, we were talking about mine specifically and that there were kids that they caught that were um, using some of the roofs as uh, skateboard, skateboarding. Right, mm -hmm. they're skateboarding. And, yep. But there has been instances where we have caught uh, firsthand, are we engaging law enforcement right away instead of, waiting and then going through our resource officer and trying to figure out in cases where I don't want to call it trespassing but in a way they're misusing the property you know well, are we key. are we trying to get law enforcement engaged a lot sooner than just trying to do it through the in addition to the resource officer yes we have because we we, we request more drive throughs you know as soon as we see some sign of kids congregating we and they do the police department will intentionally do more drive throughs up and around the back to try mm -hmm. to catch them um, but the thing is we're at a loss I mean usually um, they see they see the cruises coming and that's it they scatter they run you can't get them because um, it borders the forest you know they go right into the forest I know the police have tried you know previously we but now with the cameras we will have that visibility uh, we, we have very strategically positioned them to in order so that if they're going up on that roof or they're coming around that path, the other thing they're doing is the portables, the flat roof, they're climbing up a drain pipe and getting on top of that and skateboarding. Um, this is not a new behavior that we've seen uh, years ago at the Deca School. The entire E corridor, that very flat roof, we had the same problem. We had issues with yeah, um, so skateboarders yeah, just one more climbing about up and, and yeah. skateboarding. Right. So I understand like all the problems, yeah. but who's going to be responsible for monitoring the, the tapes? Is it going to be the resource officer? Well, or I mean, oh, no, what, no. what plan it, it's, is in? It's web access. There, it's, it's a live feed as right, well as the who's going to be monitoring store. it to, I mean, somebody's not going to be sitting in front of a computer watching it all the time. So wh what kind of schedule is going to be put in place to um, watch the tapes? I don't think it's a matter of putting a schedule in place. It would be um, custodian may come in in the morning and see some signs of th there's been activity at night. Now he'll have the capability to go to the tape 
and go back five or six hours or 12 hours or it actually stores up to like 900 hours um, it, in memory it's web access you can access it from home yep. now when the alarm goes off let's say if the alarm were to go off and uh, the head custodian gets called at home they usually get that first phone call at home um, they'd be able to go if they had a computer they'd be able to go onto a computer and immediately see what's going on around okay. the school through those okay. cameras Thank so. you, Anna. yeah um, again you know we're trying what we can do go ahead Anna all right um, chairman uh, Sweat mentioned this before. Um, I wanted to give you some additional information um, about these two special needs vehicles that we have uh, blown end. You know, we have engine failures. Uh, W5 is, is a 2002 vehicle. It's got 265,000 miles on it. Uh, B46 is a 2001 vehicle. It has 201 miles on it. You know, um, these two vehicles are for two separate mandated routes. One goes to Marshfield, one goes to Hingham. Um, the estimate is anywhere from seven to eight thousand to replace these vehicles. Uh, like the engine. Where are we going? Replace the engine or replace the vehicle? No, and okay. just the, the engine, engine if we replace the engine. The engine. We're not, okay, there it is. Um, right now, I mean, we're looking at the, these options. Um, as uh, as uh, Mr. Sweat said, we can throw good money at bad and um, replace the engines and who knows how much more life we're going to get out of the vehicles and you know there's going to be continued kind of wear and tear. Look at the age, look at the mileage. Um, if we do nothing and we have to private contract out, that would be what it's going to cost us for one half of the year to transport, to do those two routes through a private contractor. One uh, is 220 a day. It's going to cost us 19800 uh, the other route would cost us 175 a day with the private contractor for 15,750. Um, in speaking with Mr. Um, Tatro, he um, the option that I, I support, um, as well as he, is to replace those two uh, school their buses, their future you know like half buses and buses, with two used 70 vans. You can pick them up um, and be equipped for about $10,000 a piece. So for $20,000. 70s? Yeah, you can no, get them. No, no, they're called 7 7D. Oh, oh, You know, oh, the band, oh. 7 d bands. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, we have, we, we basically, <laughs> I mean, right now, <laughs> it's very inefficient the way we're doing it. Well, you know, we're transporting three kids on this huge vehicle. So. Um, the vans would actually be a more uh, cost-efficient way to also manage those types of routes as well. So, um, I mean, the statement I want to make is that I think we, w we would be really fiscally irresponsible not to do the, the right thing and save the district money. Terry? At, at, at this uh, point, I think I would like to ask if somebody in the committee would make a motion that because we have an emergency dealing with two special needs vehicles that this board um, approve us using our revolving account where we have the funds to buy two used 7D vehicles because of this emergency. Um, we do another new business? Yeah. I, I, I agree with Cliff. I think it's appropriate to, because it's technically not part of the financial report. Okay. You're and right. if we have to act within 48 hours, or can it be an agenda item? That's what I want to ask. Right. It um, can be an agenda item. Are you all set, Anna? Yes, I am. But yeah. it's the new, new year. Ken, any uh, questions? Any other questions? No, Mr. Chairman. Then it's an emergency. Yeah. Cliff, questions? No. Rhonda? No. Um, just one question. I'm. Given the discussion that we're about to have uh, under new business, apparently, the I'm not I'm surprised to see the transportation revolver decline <coughs> over the last couple of months. Can you tell me what caused that? That's I mean, I ran the. 
a detailed sheet, but I think it would take a little bit more of a time analysis that I don't think it's going to lend for today. My, my but I could uh, definitely do that for you. It says it says 48711 as the previous balance, and it says 31823 as the current balance. That's what I'm basing my question about decline. Right, but not, not according to this piece of paper. So what does it mean when it has a balance, previous balance of 48,711? I'm basically doing the same, it like the, uh, the approach we look at the LEA. We're just looking at I'm where... I'm just going by what I'm looking at. Where our balances were at this period last year. So in the... Um, so you're saying that 48,000 was where it was a year ago? A year ago. Never mind, yes. I withdraw my question. Yeah, that's okay. a year ago. That's the previous balance a year ago today. Fine, no problem. That's it. Okay. Um, does anybody have any new business they'd like to bring before the committee? I just have one quick piece. Yes. Uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to step on your uh, report as uh, chair, <coughs> but I uh, unfortunately I will not be able to attend the NSBA conference this year for the first time um, in a long time. Uh, I will be away um, on family business that for that week. Um, got a member of the family that's very ill and we want to go down and, uh, and see how she's doing. But anyways, with that being said, if you've, if you've never been to an NSBA conference and you've got it in Boston, I highly recommend that those that have never been to an NSBA conference avail themselves of the opportunity to go to this one. Um, I, you know, for all of the years that I've been in education um, and all the conferences and all the workshops that I've gone to, um, this is by far one of the best, and their workshops are fantastic. Their, their guest, their uh, guest speakers and public sessions are fantastic, and uh, I think you will be uh, very, very impressed as to the scope and magnitude of this organization and how it functions. And uh, we are an affiliate, and uh, I, I strongly recommend uh, to anyone that wants to go, but particularly to those that have never been to the NSBA conference. Make, a, make an attempt to go because it's really worth the time. Thank you. It's the first time I will be able to go. Yeah, it's really worth it. And I hope that this one in Boston is as good as the ones that I've attended. Anything else? What Barry, do you want to bring this up? Okay. Um, I, I really truly believe in uh, under full disclosure for the members who don't realize, um, there has there's an interpretation that's been done of the town charter, which says that you cannot buy a vehicle unless it goes to town meeting. Um, and but emergencies like this have to be dealt with. And I know that there's been a legal opinion asked for by the chairman of the. Um, Capital Planning Committee, um, but I think we need two vehicles, otherwise we're going to have to hire another company to transport these children, and we're going to be spending more money out of that budget, which is not fiscally responsible. So um, the money is in the revolver, and I really truly believe that we should use it. This is an emergency, and I don't think I can wait until... Um, January 11th to then tell our coordinator to start looking for it. And this may bring the issue to a head. By coordinator, you meant manager. Manager. Yes. Um, comments, questions? Rhonda? And the one question that I had is that my understanding is that I didn't think that it had to go through uh, town meeting in an emergency situation, but any purchases of capital over 5,000 need to be approved by the chief procurement officer, which would be the TA. That's correct. And so my question is, first of all, is that your that's your interpretation also? Um, because and if it it's is a vehicle, I would say yes, in that um, the figure really is above um, when we have an active um, town accountant in town hall, the normal was $25,000. Anything above that, the town accountant needed to sign off on. 
um, and the procurement officer. Um, both of these fall below that number, um, but I would bring it to the town administrator um, as the chief procurement officer. I can't imagine him not approving this, given the fact it's going to cost us three times the money to go another route. I won't venture a guess on what will occur. <laughs> It, go ahead, Rhonda. You also. Well, so then my question to this committee is: Should our motion state that with approval of the chief procurement officer, procurement, no. I don't know, whatever officer? No. I think I need, as the um, chief operations chief person, the um, ability to run the transportation department. Ken, any questions or comments? No, no. Uh, Rhonda asked my question. I was just concerned as to how that ties in with the town administrator. And, um, but I understand the situation. Dr. Rabinovich, we're talking about throwing good money up to bad. Do we know the complete uh, condition of these used vehicles? Yeah. Uh, no. What we haven't ventured. We haven't to looked at it yet. No. But th we know that there are available vans that, you know, we're talking somewhere between 25,000 and 40,000 miles um, that you can get for about $8,000. It costs you $800 to do the conversion, so to make them um, a 70 with the lights and the painting and the, you know, stop sign and so forth. Uh, again, through you, Mr. Chair, to the superintendent, then are we looking realistically to purchase these before the students return after the, uh, the Christmas break? Because Depending we're down on how fast vehicles. we can find them uh -huh. and if they are appropriate, um, and then putting together a requisition and then bringing it up to the town administrator. Uh, I can't say that that will be done by, um, you know, the Tuesday. Um, you know, January 2nd, but we would try to get it done as soon as possible. So we're down two vehicles as of now. Yes. If it can't be done before then, are we looking at contracting out until we it can be done? We may have to contract out until. Um, I, Mr. Chair, there's a question? Yes. No, I didn't want to jump on Kenny. Oh, I'm sorry. Please do. No. No, no, no. no, no. I, Cliff is right. Are you all set? Yes. Okay. Cliff? Um, how are we doing it now? These kids are in school. Um, I know we got vacation coming up. Mrs. Sure. Miranda may have an answer. Go ahead. Anna. We're currently using the two spares that we have, which means another vehicle, another van goes down. That's it. We're, we're at nothing. Um, right now we're using the two. We, you know, you've got to have uh, industry standard is you should have at least four to five spares in big buses and in the 7Ds at least three to four. Um, we have two and those are the ones that we're using now because these vehicles are out of use. Cliff? I'm ready for a motion. I'm going to make it. Uh, no, not quite yet. Okay. It, it, it does seem to me that there are three choices and I think it probably would be a good idea to, to write this these, this up if, um, and, and give it to the TA. Um, but I'll leave that to your discretion, but just for notes. One choice would be to spend fifteen, sixteen thousand um, dollars getting the, the uh, short buses repaired, and that would be, it seemed to me, the, an example of, as I said earlier, uh, good money after bad. Um, the second choice is to spend 25% more than that and get vehicles that have a much greater life expectancy uh, than we would have even after the repair. And then the third choice would be to spend, what, close to $30,000, something like $30,000 or so? Yeah, and that's for half for, a and year. And that's just for the remainder of the year. Yep, remainder of the year. Um, the if we right. did that, which is which is irrational in a different way, that would generate a deficit in non-net and theoretically force us to go to town meeting to pay the bill. To pay, to, to pay the bill. 
which is obviously something we want to avoid at all costs. So I think the, the rational approach is to do exactly what you're recommending, but I think it would be um, good of us to, to vote to do it, but also to let the town administrator know that it's an emergency. We think if it was presented to rational people to approve in a non-emergency situation, they would do exactly what we're doing. Um, so on that, uh, I will take a motion to, uh, to purchase the, the 270 vehicles. Okay. I'll move to allow the superintendent uh, within uh, purchasing protocols of the town um, to uh, investigate the replacement of two special education vehicles that require new engines. To, to investigate? Uh, to procure. Okay. To, to purchase. Right. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Yes. So we, uh, now that I, you, you changed the word to procure. To procure. allow the superintendent to procure within the confines of all procurement protocols um, the the two spe special education vehicles that require new engines. Okay. Rhonda, you have a? The second part, the procurement. Can we have a second for discussion, Mr. I Speaker? thought we had one. Yeah, I did. Oh, right. I did. Go but ahead. I just wanted to clarify that all right. you took investigate out. Go ahead. Okay. For discussion. Go ahead. I mean, now we can have discussion. Go ahead. Could we add? Um, the second part, Cliff, that you said, procurement of the special needs buses under the procurement procedures? Protocols. Protocols of the Relative town charter. Procurement protocols. Of the town charter. All right, of the town no, charter. Sure. Mr. Chair, I, I object to that because of the interpretation of the town charter. Um, I believe if we send it to three different attorneys, we'll get three different interpretations. Would you feel more comfortable if we inserted the word emergency into there? Because that's really the basis under which you feel comfortable. You know, we're getting into legal legals here around here. We just want them to conform to the protocols that have been established, whatever they may be. You know, we mm -hmm. can legal legal it all to death, but we're not lawyers. Agre so. Agreed. And you're right that emergency is part of the protocols. So, yeah. So, are you comfortable with yes. the motion? Yes. Okay. Please, <laughs> and give give <coughs> Michelle the mic, please, Rhonda. Dr. Sylvia moved to allow the superintendent within the purchasing protocols of the town to purchase two 7D vehicles that require new engines, seconded by Mr. Fon. Are we all set? I thought it was emergency procedures. Um, I suggested to, to make Dr. Rabinovich more comfortable to add the word emergency, Cliff did not want that to be part of his motion. Uh, Dr. Rabinovich. the motion. Vote it down. I, I don't. Dr. Rabinovich doesn't feel he needs it. Okay. So it doesn't. It, there's no point. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Um, all those opposed? No. Three, uh, one, zero. Okay, any further business? I'm all set. Okay, we are going into executive session. When we come out of executive session, we will just be voting to adjourn. Uh, I would like a vote to go into executive session. Ken? For what? For For the 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 sorry, the purpose is an update on uh, labor relations matters. And executive session. Yes, thank you. And executive, we have them? I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. And executive session minutes. Thank yes. You. Ken? Yes. Cliff? Yes. Rhonda? Yes. Even though my back. Yes. We are in executive session. Thank you, everybody. We'll you, me, and Barry are like a mash unit. He's got a neck problem, back a neck problem, pro. shoulder problem, <laughs> and the healthy two are down that end. <laughs>